Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kind of represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer-to-peer -peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that. And eventually Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller, which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now fast forward, they came out with what was known as a domain, but fast forward to the year 2000, Microsoft releases their newest domain technology, and they call it uh, Active Directory. And Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle. All right, and a domain controller was a, a server, essentially, that had a database on it, and that database was the Active Directory database. So let's just kind of fix that here. This little cylinder looking thing I'm going to make here is going to represent my Active Directory database. So uh, AD. All right. Um, and this was is what we still call to this day, we call it ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services. And usually if you hear that term, uh, Active Directory Domain Services, it means it's an on-premise domain although there is a version of this that can be hosted in the cloud known as Azure Active Directory Domain Services. I'm not getting into that right now. So anyway, um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller. You, the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server really. One reason being um, to break up the disbursement of load. These machines will authenticate with these domain controllers and the more machines you got, uh, you know, you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller, right? The other consideration is redundancy. If you only have one and that server goes down, well, you're in trouble, right? So we want to have multiple. 
The other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a. I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here, and this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my a uh, user. So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now, the interesting thing about user accounts, or the interesting thing really about domain controllers, is that they replicate. So everything you do on one. Uh, will replicate over to the other. So if I create a user account on that first one, well, replication is going to occur between uh, both of them. And so this little arrow thing I'm going to make here is going to represent replication. So domain controllers replicate. That means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands of machine and it's going to, you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller. All right. The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos. All right. Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically. Okay. Uh, now, there was an older protocol that, that, uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy for older pr uh, prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the, um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines clients, domain controllers, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, all of these machines would register with our DNS. All right, and this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So, for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together... This, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our uh, domain controllers, too, is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, Group Policy Objects. A Group Policy Object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change on machines. 
you can do it through a GPO. So for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO. But what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate. So when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have... Um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back we have an Active Directory domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering, you know, we've been using it for, for decades, and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated a lot of them over the years to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past. So it's very common. And this person needs the ability, perhaps, to you know be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay, um, and we've got a file server, but you know ultimately, we we you probably are aware that you know in the past um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So you know your companies might have they might have a file server. But then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that that users need to access. Let's let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular by Microsoft on-premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices. And um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here. Make a little bit of room here. 
and I'm going to shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right. So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary, but nowadays it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and, you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker. This, uh, this little, this little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right. And let's make him, let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good. All right. I'm just going to, I'm going to give him like a, let's give him like a devil horns, some devil horns here. And maybe like, uh, you know, he's, he's in a bad mood. I'm going to give him a frowny face give him some fangs and maybe the fangs are dripping blood every okay no I'm just kidding <laughs> sorry sometimes I get carried away all right but uh, anyway that's gonna be my hacker all right goofy looking little hacker person all right and um, so we don't want this hacker like spying on my user we don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside so how do we get around that well usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN a virtual private network so the way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically, it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server, or also known as an RRAS server because it stood for Routing and Remote Access Services. But um, anyway, Remote Access Services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the, um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall and that would be it wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server, okay? So you set up a web server, all right? Maybe this is going to be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you going to do that? Where are you going to put that web server? Are you going to put it internally inside the domain like you see here? And the reason that's scary is because you would have to open up port 443, port 80, which is the HTTP, HTTP ports to allow traffic to get in, which means... Not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur, where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we'd want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about you know people getting you know allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was, would be called the uh, internal connected firewall. And then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ 
demilitarized zone, or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there. Uh, whatever ports there that you need and now traffic would be able to get to this web server okay um, and so uh, even if a hacker you know somehow hacks this web server you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources the only traffic that you might allow would be VPN okay um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work all right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I want to look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file server, SQL exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? You could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody. It's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU, and they can grow and shrink as they need. And that's the, the, the small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity. Of course, when you get into cloud computing, you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the 
you know, the, the board in these big data centers, but not to get into that just yet here. But that's the idea. Hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is. And with that is really where, you know, cloud computing started to come into play, which I'm not explaining in this video. But hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well, the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization. And now we'll, in this next section, we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services. Now with the creation of virtualization, this got companies thinking, hmm, if we can emulate hardware, we can create this uh, these virtual machines and we can store software on that we can have operating systems running on that emulated hardware the operating systems being called guest operating systems we could technically host these virtual machines for companies for a price as a service so the idea being you know hey you pay us uh, a fee each month and we'll host your virtual servers and you don't have to deal with all the headaches of you know, hosting your own data center on premise and the power that's needed to do that and the air conditioning that's needed to do that, all the hardware that's needed to do that, as well as the knowledge of how all the hardware works. So this is essentially what a cloud company brings to the table. So various companies like Google and IBM and Microsoft and Apple and, and all these, these companies, a lot of them already had uh, tons of data centers, these big massive warehouses all over the world that they could support it. Some of these companies, such as Microsoft and IBM and uh, uh, Amazon, and Amazon being one of the, the biggest and first, uh, decided to open this up to the public for a fee and allow you to host um, your services in their data centers. So this is where cloud computing really comes into place. So this, this big cloud here is gonna represent uh, cloud computing mainly the Microsoft cloud computing. And of course, it's all connected to the internet with incredibly fast, high-speed internet connections, fiber connections, and all of that. Um, so there's some terminology or some acronyms I want to talk a little bit about real fast here as we get into this. Um, first off, in cloud computing, there is an acronym we call IAAS. That stands for Infrastructure as a Service, okay? Infrastructure as a service means that a provider is is hosting all of the hardware infrastructure for you, and then they are going to provide you with a way for you to interact with that hardware and utilize their hardware as a service. All right, um, and this of course is where Azure comes into play. Microsoft Azure. Now you might pronounce that word different. People have different ways of saying Azure. Some people call it Azure. Some people call it Azure. Some people call it, uh, I've even heard it called Azure before, uh, Azure. <laughs> There's various names for it. In fact, uh, years ago when I was first learning Azure, I decided I wanted to make sure I was, I was pronouncing this correctly. So I was like, I'm gonna go to watch the developers. So I started watching videos of the, the developers, the, the people who created Azure. And uh, I figured I would determine the very first video I ever watched, the guy was pronouncing it the word Azure. So that's how I say it. But what I further learned is that um, the Microsoft developers don't agree on how to say it either. Uh, some of them say Azure. Some of them call it Azure. Uh, some of them call it Azure. So anyway, tomato, tomato, pronounce it however you want to pronounce it, okay? But Azure is Microsoft's main IAAS system. What this is, is Microsoft is going to host, they've got all these uh, data centers all over the world, and they're going to host their hardware so that you can host on top of their hardware your virtual machines or whatever it is. So you can host virtual machines. Microsoft will also allow uh, you to have access to what are called virtual appliances, like uh, virtual firewalls, uh, also virtual load balancing software because you can get um, you get access to what are called VNets. This is virtual networking. So you can create these virtual networks based on TCP IP that are running your, you know, in their cloud service with virtual machines on it. And then you can put a virtual firewall. So you can almost like recreate what you're seeing here in an on-premise environment. You can recreate that in the cloud. Um, they also provide 
uh, virtual storage so you can store data and backup data out there um, they support uh, database hosting all of that that's all part of IAS now with IAS the, the model for that for the most part is you pay for what you use so there's a, a, a an algorithm that looks at how much memory how much processing power how much storage that's being used and then you you get a fee each month for what you're using the good news is they do have a, a calculator that kind of helps you forecast this and um, you can even set uh, alarms to let you know if you're approaching a certain budget that you got on cost there's a lot of things out there to help you do that but that's the idea you pay for what you use okay now there is another couple of terms I want to mention as well this next term is called platform as a service and then there's a third term called software as a service so platform as a service uh, PaaS and software as a service platform as a service uh, and software as a, let me explain software as a service first because that'll be it's pretty easy to visualize and then I'll explain platform as a service so the idea of software as a service is uh, basically they have applications that can be hosted in the cloud service apps if you will these apps are a hundred percent ready to use ready for you to take advantage of all you gotta do is use those applications okay for example Microsoft has what's called office for the web or it used to be called office online so that's like Microsoft Word Excel PowerPoint you can run it from within your web browser uh, you you know all you got to do is just jump right in and, and use it and so from an admin standpoint all we have to do is you know assign the users that are allowed to, to use that and they can go use it and it's available to them 100% all they got to do is start using it there's not really a lot of administration for us now what is platform as a service well platform as a service is a system in which um, the majority of the the configuration is done for us but we still have some admin configuration we have to do to use it for example with with virtual machines this is a hundred percent IAAS a virtual machine is it's a you can put whatever operating system on there but you're responsible for the operating system you're responsible for the software that goes on it you as an admin have to manage all that okay with platform as a service virtual machines are set up in the background that you don't have any control over they've already put the operating system on there they've already put the software on there you don't have any control over any of that but there's still some administration you have to do uh, in order to control it for example um, Microsoft has a directory service called Azure AD now this is a big deal this is probably one of the biggest deals of the things I've gone over so far in this cloud Azure Active Directory is what we call a platform as a service it is a directory service that is sort of the cloud version of what you have here called uh, uh, ADDS so um, now I remember when I first heard about Azure A Active Directory I thought oh well this is just like you're just hosting virtual domain controllers in the cloud no they have completely redone the concepts of Active Directory it is completely redone with all new web-based programming languages it does not use any of the dated stuff like LDAP and Kerberos and all that it uses industry standard authentication uh, protocols in order to support all the latest and greatest features and capabilities in the cloud okay and so these are where users passwords all of that stuff is going to be managed in the cloud but it starts out with almost nothing in it so it's ready to use but you as an admin have to start creating users and and all of that now you might say well wait a minute what if I want to use my on-premise users in the cloud well stand by I'll explain that in a second anyway Azure AD is a platform as a service so is here's another one exchange online Microsoft has exchange online that's a that's a, a that is actually both a, a platform as a service and a software as a service in that um, the admin side of it is the platform as a service but the user side is the software as a service same thing for SharePoint online Microsoft has uh, SharePoint online as well same idea there all right and then you've got Microsoft Teams that's a the the admin side of that is a platform as a service but the user side of that is a software as a service um, there is uh, OneDrive for business 
that's a, a cloud storage that we have access to that uh, allows users to store their data out there in the cloud. There is a product called Intune, which is Microsoft's uh, MDM product. MDM, it's also MAM product, so it's, it's both. A mobile device management, that allows us to manage devices. This is one of the most powerful things we have uh, available to us. This is what sort of is, is replacing the concept of GPOs. This is going to allow us to manage our device settings. Not only can we manage on-premise devices, but we can manage mobile devices. GPOs can only manage devices for Windows. With Intune, we can manage Windows, Android, iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, all that stuff. Um, with the help of Intune, we can manage the settings and restrictions. We can deploy software. This is a very, very powerful product okay, that we have available to us. Um, it even has a thing called Autopilot, which will allow us to reconfigure uh, Windows machines and all of that. So very, very powerful stuff that uh, we have available to us. All right. Um, now, I will tell you that Azure has, um, Azure definitely has some of the, uh, you know, it has some platform as a service technologies and some software as a services technologies, but the the main um, the main type of system that Microsoft has created for platform as a service and software as a service is called Microsoft 365. Okay, Microsoft 365. All right, which I forgot to add to my display here. We actually do have apps that are called the Microsoft 365 apps. All right which formerly they would call them Office 365 apps. They're now you know, starting to call them Microsoft 365 apps. But the Microsoft 365 services is, it's, it is a, a cloud service that basically sits on top of Azure. So you have Azure in the, the, the background of all this and the Microsoft 365 sitting on top of it. All right. You can't have a Microsoft 365 um account or tenant that doesn't also have Azure. Azure is um, in the background no matter what. And the other thing to be aware of is both of these share Azure AD. So the, you'll notice that you, you there are web portals for creating users and things through Microsoft 365 or creating users through Azure. It all ties back to Azure AD. You're going to see the same users no matter what. So these two things are glued together basically. Okay, they're glued together. Now, on Microsoft 365 with PaaS and SaaS and all that, you're not really going to be hosting virtual machines, but you're going to you're going to be working with um, these services. Let's just kind of color code some of this real quick. All right. Now, again, I do want to add that Azure does have PaaS and SaaS services that I'm not getting into right now, but it's mainly an IaaS based service. That's that's its main focus. Microsoft 365 uh, is strictly PaaS related and, and software as a service, SaaS related. It doesn't really have any virtual machines or any of that, though it can interact with them. Okay, um, so if I was to sort of draw a, a circle around some of these, all of this stuff you see here would be, this would be uh, Azure related. And then all of this stuff you see right here would be the Microsoft 365 related. Now, um, they both share Azure AD, so I'm gonna put a pur purple circle around that. Red and blue make purple, <laughs> all right? Um, and so they, they all link to that, okay? And so that is how uh, Microsoft handles that those concepts. The other thing about Azure is with Azure, you're paying for the CPU, RAM, storage you use. With Microsoft 365, it's all based on licenses. So you, you purchase these subscriptions that have a certain amount of licenses, and you issue these licenses out to your users, and your users can take advantage of these various features. Okay. One more thing I want to explain here, and that is what about the issue of what if we want to uh, use our on-premise users to access resources in Azure? Well, Microsoft has a solution for that. 
they actually have a type of server that you can set up and the server is called an Azure AD Connect server. Azure AD Connect. Now what does this do? An Azure AD Connect server, this is a synchronization based system and what it will do is it will allow uh, my on-premise users to be synchronized out to Azure AD. Now, it does not allow Azure AD users to be synced in, only out. But it will allow user passwords and all of that uh, to be synced in. So if a, user is, uh, if a user is logging on to Azure AD and they change their password out in the cloud, it'll, it, can, it does have the ability to synchronize that password back in. But the beauty of this is, is by going this route, if you have this on-premise environment, um, you can achieve what we call SSO. What is SSO? Single sign-on. The idea of single sign-on with all of this is my user can sit down at their on-premise computer, they can log on, and it's going to log them on both in the cloud as well, as, or sorry, it's going to log them on on-premise as well as in the cloud at the same time. All right, and uh, they can access resources out there. The other thing I'll tell you is that Microsoft has moved into a way to where you could actually, you could technically not even have a domain nowadays. You don't necessarily have to have a domain. In fact, it, it pains me to say this as a consultant because, you know, I have fed my family for, you know, two decades by uh, using Active Directory, both teaching it as well as, um, you know, consulting on it. But I'll be honest, Microsoft is now moving in a direction to where domains are not even needed anymore. Um, they're now making it possible to where everything can be managed through your cloud service and domains are not needed. But if, if you're a company that's already got a domain and all this is still in place and all of that, then this Azure AD Connect server is going to be the thing that's going to help you. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully this has now uh, helped you have a better understanding. This was really just a fundamentals video um, to help you understand the cloud service, the concepts of it. And I hope that this has been helpful to you. Now, if you're going to do server administration, uh, one of the things that is definitely going to be necessary is that you understand PowerShell. Um, not only that, you're taking an exam, PowerShell is definitely going to be one of these things that's going to show up. So. It's important to have the fundamentals down of PowerShell, not to mention there's going to be uh, PowerShell references and stuff that we're going to look at throughout the rest of the course, and it's very important that you understand it. So we're going to start with some fundamental concepts to make sure you understand uh, how the, the base of PowerShell is going to operate and how you can administer servers with it. Okay. So first things first, PowerShell came out in the year 2006. Uh, it is a much more powerful command line environment than what we had prior to that, which was just called Command Prompt, which was originally DOS. And Microsoft, uh, they wanted to add something that could essentially touch every part of the operating system. So they came out with it in 2006. Uh, it was fully implemented with Exchange 2007, and it's been in every operating system ever since. And it's, again, one of these foundational concepts that pretty much we have to understand uh, going forward because you can really speed up the, the process of server administration, client administration, cloud administration if you understand it. Okay, uh, You can write scripts, you can automate things, and there's just a, there's a lot of benefits to having a, a good understanding of PowerShell. All right. So to begin with here, how do we get into PowerShell? Um, well, probably the easiest way is just to right-click your Start button and go to PowerShell. You'll notice there's a couple of versions of PowerShell. You have just regular PowerShell and PowerShell with an admin. The admin is going to obviously give you administrative privileges, and then regular PowerShell is just going to treat you like you're a regular user. Um, so you can also go down here and do a search for PowerShell, and you'll see that there's an x86 version of PowerShell. That's the 32-bit version of PowerShell. So if you were uh, interacting with something that needed to be 32-bit instead of 64-bit, then you could utilize that version. Okay. But I'm going to right-click the Start button, go to Windows PowerShell, and here I am inside PowerShell. The one thing I'm going to know right out of the gates is that if it says PS in front of it, I'm in PowerShell. Another way to get into PowerShell is if you were in Command Prompt, uh, you can simply just type the word PowerShell, and that will bring you into PowerShell. 
So that's another way. Now I tend to like to, to right click. I like that blue background. It kind of indicates that I'm in PowerShell and not Command Prompt. It's just more of a visual cue. You can adjust the settings of PowerShell by right clicking the, the window bar here. And you can adjust your font and all that if you want. All right. So here I am in PowerShell. Now the first thing to understand about PowerShell is that it uses a, a verb noun system. So that basically means that uh, everything you type is going to start usually with a verb. All right. So like get is a verb, meaning get me some information. Um, set is a verb, meaning I want to modify some kind of parameter or setting. Okay. I want to set something. Add means I want to add something. So I want to add something to something else. Like for example, if I wanted to add a user to a group, I could do that. The word new means I want to create something new. Okay. Move, well, obviously means I want to move something. Copy means I want to copy something. Uh, and so those are your main verbs, all right? So from there, you're going to follow up the command or commandlet as it's called with what's known as a noun. There's going to be a dash that will separate the verb and the noun. So for example, if I wanted to see what services are running on this machine right now, I could type get and then dash and the word service. Now, before I hit enter, I also want to point out that PowerShell supports what's called IntelliSense. IntelliSense means that it can try to detect what it is you're typing. For example, if I just typed the get and the letter S and then I hit tab, you're going to notice it's, it's uh, going to try to detect what I'm trying to type, right? And I can tab through, just continuously hit tab until I find the command I'm looking for. If I, if I accidentally pass the command I'm looking for, I can hold the shift key down and I can go backwards. Okay, so I can go forwards, I can go backwards. Another thing you can do is if you type a few more characters, it'll get a better, uh, it'll get a more accurate look at what it is I'm trying to find. For example, if I type get se, it's going to narrow down the IntelliSense and it's going to toggle through each one of the uh, nouns that start with se. So there you go, there's service. And I highly recommend that you utilize tab. Tab is going to help you uh, not typo stuff. It's going to help you type faster. So as I always like to tell people, tab is your friend. Use tab, all right? So we're going to hit enter, and you're going to be able to see the different services that are running uh, right now on the machine. I can kind of scroll up and down looking at those different services. Okay. Uh, now if I want to modify one of those services, I can change the verb, right? So for example, there is a service right now called the WinRM service, which is a pretty important service for PowerShell because this is what is known as Windows Remote Management. This is actually what PowerShell uses when it wants to remote into uh, another machine. Actually, that service, it's more important for that service to be running on the destination machine you're connecting into than the source machine. But notice that that service is running right now. So let's say I wanted to stop uh, the WinRM service right now. I could actually type the word stop, right? That's my verb, and then put a dash, and then um, the, the, the word service, right? So just tab through that, and there it is. Now, if I hit enter, you're going to notice that it's going gonna, it's gonna to pop back and say, hey, you gotta, you got to specify an input object. So the important thing to understand about PowerShell as well is that PowerShell uh, needs parameters for certain commands. Parameters are required pieces of information that are going to be needed for PowerShell to do its job. Okay, um, the, the analogy I like to use there is it's kind of like if you go to a restaurant, let's say the restaurant that you go to to eat, uh, you know, you're going to get dinner or something. The restaurant um, works off PowerShell. So you you go to the restaurant and you you type sit dash chair uh, and you sit in the chair and you type uh, order dash food and a waiter pops out and says, okay, what can I get you? And uh, at that point, you're going to need to specify some parameters, right? You need to specify what kind of food you want. So for example, if I was going to order steak and I typed order dash steak, um, at that point, the, the problem is, is that the waiter's going to want to know, okay, so you want steak. Well, how do you want your steak cooked? What kind of steak do you want? You have parameters that you have to specify. So a lot of PowerShell commands are going to work like that. All right. So let's say I don't understand how to use the command. I'm going to hit enter. It's going to throw an error. Okay. One thing you'll notice about PowerShell is that it gives you pretty detailed errors. Okay. But I'm going to use a command called get help. So I'm going to type get dash help. 
So you guys with Linux experience, you can also type the word man next to that, M-A-N. Um, that's kind of how we would do it in Linux. But I'm going to type git-help, and then I'm going to type stop-service, okay? Stop-service, and I'm going to hit enter. And it's going to give me some help information that I can look at on how to use the command. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the help documentation within PowerShell. I prefer to just do a search on the, the help. Uh, one thing you can do, some commands will let you do a dash online and it'll it'll pop the, the website up, but not all commands support that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to type stop dash service. From there, there's like 99% of the time, there is a... Um, there is a, a, a manual document that Microsoft has set up on their website. All you got to do is just do a quick Google search and you can find it. There it is right there, stop-service. So I'm going to click on that and it's going to give me information. It's going to tell me each one of the parameters. It's also going to give me examples, which I really, really like. Okay. Now, I will also tell you that in, in some cases with PowerShell, you can type dash examples and they'll have some examples uh, built in. Not all commands have examples though okay so just be aware of that they they do on the help documents that are on Microsoft's website so I'm a huge fan of using their help documentation guys you can always if you don't understand how to use a command you can just about always do a search find the, the help document and it'll give you examples on how to use it so if I want to stop the WinRM service there's an example of how I can do that I'm gonna copy that and then I'm going to come into PowerShell and I'll check this out. All I got to do is just right click the window and it's going to type it in for me. All right. And then I'm just going to change the service name. All right. WinRM. And just like that, the WinRM service now should be stopped. Uh, you don't get like a congratulatory message or anything. If, if A lot of times with PowerShell, if no, I should say no news is good news. If you don't get an error, it worked. So now we're going to do get dash service. And by the way, you can hit the up arrow on your keyboard and cycle back through your previous commands. So there it is, get service, and you'll notice that WinRM is stopped, which also means that if I wanted to start it back up, it's probably going to be the same thing, right? Start dash service, right? Then dash. Now, get this, IntelliSense also supports the parameters as well. So I can toggle through the parameters just like that, hitting tab, which is really great being able to do that. All right. So the dash name is the one I want. I'm going to say WinRM. And then at that point, it should be started up. And it is. Okay. So we're in good shape. All right. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of commands in PowerShell. Like I could type git process. I could see the processes that are running. All right. If I wanted to see... Uh, what the event logs are doing in Windows right now, I could type git dash event log, hit enter. Oh no, there's, there's some parameters that I need. Well, again, all I got to do is just go to Google, right? Type the command in there, git event log, hit enter. There's the command. All right, here's the help document that it's pulling up. I can scroll down and I can see examples on how to use the command, all right? So in my case, uh, I'm going to do something like this, get event log, uh, log name system, okay, newest. So if I do that, let's just hit enter, get event log, log name, the system log, and then show me the newest five results. There we go, there's the newest five results. Now what are we looking at? Well, if we right click start here, we can open up the event viewer in uh, on our server. We can expand the Windows logs and then click System. These are the logs that we're talking about here. Okay. Um, of course, it'll take a moment to load these up because there's a bunch of log entries. But once that loads up, you'll you'll see those. Um, now, another thing you'll notice is that it it kind of uh, uh, minimizes the information. You don't see it all expanded out. So what I can do is I can change the formatting with PowerShell. I can use uh, what's known as the pipe command, which is that little uh, uh, um, character right there. It's the character above the enter key if you hold down shift, right? And so piping is going to take the uh, the output from one command 
and it's going to attach it to the input of another command. So there's actually a nice little command called format-list. So right now this is formatted as a table, and I can say format this as a list, and it's going to format it as a list. I can hit enter, and it's now going to format it as a list. So now it's going to expand it all out. All right, now check this out. I can also, if I hit the up arrow, I'm going to pipe it again, and I'm going to, I'm going to say out-file to c colon slash, and we'll just say log.txt, and it's going to dump it to a text file. So we'll hit enter. We'll go to our C drive now. Uh, let me pull that up. And there's the log, and here it is in a text file. All right. So very, very simplistic uh, commands there that you can run. You can change the log if you want. Like I could, I could change it to security if I want, or, or application, or whatever. And it's gonna, it's gonna put it in that file. All right. So um, the other thing about PowerShell, sometimes the trick to PowerShell is just figuring out what command you're looking for that you, you're trying to perform. Um, so for example, let's say I'm, I'm trying to perform a command that's got the word net in it, and I can't remember the command. So what I can do is I can type git dash command. You can hit enter, and then from there, you're going to see every single commandlet that's in memory right now uh, it's going to list them all out on your screen, which of course is very intimidating. There's a huge list of commands. So let me show you how we can narrow down the command. So let's say I'm trying to find a command that has the word net, N-E-T, somewhere in the command. I can type git command, check this out, hit space, dash noun, okay? And then if I just type the word net, nothing's going to happen, okay? Because there is no command where the noun is just the word net, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a wildcard. If I put a star symbol, an asterisk symbol, after the word net, then, um, then it would show me every command that, that where the noun starts with the word net. If I put the asterisk before the word net, it's going to show me every command that ends with the word net. If I put the asterisk at the front and the back of the, the, the word net, then it's going to show me every command that has the word net as the noun. So if I hit enter, there's every command that has the word net somewhere in the noun, right there, okay? All right, so let's say that um, I wanna narrow down my search even more. The, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add the, I'm gonna hit the up arrow, hit dash verb, and we're gonna put the word reset in there. So I'm narrowing it down. So I know the verb has the word reset in it, and the noun has the word net. And look at there, we've now narrowed this down. And the course again, let's say that uh, the command we were looking for was uh, maybe this command right here, reset uh, net adapter. So I'm just going to right click that and I'm going to go again, good old Google, go back over to Google, paste the command in there, hit enter, and look at there, there's a help document. So it's very important, again, that if you don't understand how to use a command in PowerShell, you, you actually can just go in and uh, do a quick Google search. Here's examples on how to use the command. All right, and again, I'm a much bigger fan of doing that than the little get help command that they've got, even though that command is nice. Um, I feel like it's, it's better to actually go and, uh, and look the help document up on the internet, okay? All right, so the other thing about, uh, about working with PowerShell is that PowerShell uses these things called modules, okay? modules uh, load more commands in memory. You got to understand that there are hundreds of thousands of commands out there. Okay, and um, so if we type git dash module, all right, you can see that these are the current modules that are stored in in memory right now. Okay, so if I am uh, if I am wanting to run certain commands, uh, I need to have the modules loaded in memory. For example, Active Directory uh, one of the things you can do um, once you have Active Directory loaded is you can have the Active Directory commands loaded into memory so that you can run those, okay? So you, you can say import module name Active Directory and it's now loading all the Active Directory commands into memory, okay? Um, keep in mind, you need to have Active Directory and all that going, but you can load those in memory. Uh, you can also download commands from the internet as well. 
So uh, Microsoft has this thing called the PowerShell Gallery. Okay, if I go to PowerShellGallery.com, you'll see right here there's there's lots and lots and lots of commands that are out there. Okay, um, so I can look up a command that I want. Like I'll just th think of something off the top of my head. Uh, how about Autopilot? So there's a cloud technology called Autopilot. I'm not getting into it right now. But if I do a search on Autopilot, here is a script for... Uh, dealing with autopilot, it's going to grab something called the device uh, information off a machine, the hardware ID of your computer, so it can be used with this thing called autopilot. So if I wanted this command um, from the PowerShell gallery, I can click on it um, and I can run this command right here. Copy it, install dash script. All right, so if I do that, let's just paste that in. Install dash script name, get Windows autopilot. You got to make sure you have an internet connection in order to do this. If you don't have an internet connection, this is not gonna work. But it's gonna tell you, okay, so to download scripts, it's gotta create a path variable. The path variable is um, going to be the place where scripts are stored. Are you sure you wanna do this? Yes. All right. So it's gonna go ahead and create that, uh, that location on your hard drive to store scripts so that it can run scripts. All right. Um, so from there, it's gonna ask you if you wanna install Nougat. Nougat is the software that's gonna let you download um, scripts from the internet. So we're just going to go ahead and say yes to that. All right, so it's going to go ahead and install Nougat. All right, and then the next thing is um, it's going to ask me if, uh, if I'm sure I want to install the script because it's going to be downloaded from an untrusted source. The PowerShell gallery is an untrusted repository. Oddly enough, Microsoft owns the repository, but it's an untrusted repository. And the reason it's an untrusted repository is because it's a community repository. It's not just um, just Microsoft people that, that upload scripts there. Um, uh, the community, other people can upload scripts as well. Although they do have good moderators that generally make sure there's nothing bad that gets uploaded. So I'm gonna go ahead and say yes to that and hit enter. And at that point, um, that's it. The script should be available. I should be able to say get dash um, windows autopilot info.ps1 and there you go. There's the script. Uh, I'm not going to try to run that script. I'm not really explaining what that script does right now. I just wanted to demonstrate how to download scripts off the internet. Okay, the PS1 is a script file. That's what that extension is. Okay, all right. Okay, so now hopefully you have, um, you understand some fundamentals of how to use PowerShell. Uh, this is just the basics of PowerShell, and um, and there's there's other concepts to look into as well, like uh, communicating with the network and the ISC. But these are just the fundamentals of PowerShell. I now like to walk you through and help you understand the concepts of domains, trees, and forests. Now, if you haven't already, it's very important that you go back and watch the foundation videos at the beginning of the course. The foundation videos outline the, the basic concepts of what a domain is. So this, this video here is going to assume that you've watched that and that you do have an understanding of the basic concepts of what a domain is. And we're going to kind of expand from there, okay? So um, let's talk about domains, trees, and forests. Now to start out with, uh, one concept I want to get across to you is that this, this concept of, of what a forest is. First thing to be aware of is that every single Active Directory domain must be part of this thing called a forest, okay? Uh, as well as a tree. It is, there is no way possible for a domain to not be part of a domain, uh, to not be part of a forest uh, and a tree, okay? Um, a lot of people think, well, what if you have a single domain, uh, then that then it's not part of a tree or a forest. You have to have at least two domains to have what's called a tree, and you have to have at least two trees to make a forest. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. Okay, um, I can tell you I've taught Active Directory Design for, for, I think, about 21 years of my life. I can tell you that every single domain must be part of a tree and must be part of a forest. If you don't have a tree in a forest when you set up a domain, you will have one when it's all said and done, even if it's just a single domain. So in this diagram that I've got up on the screen, this domain is a domain, a tree, and a forest all rolled into one. It's not a very big tree, it's not a very big forest, but it is a tree and a forest all rolled into one, okay? Now ultimately, 
when most people think of trees and forests, this concept of trees and forests, you generally think of more than one domain. And I'll give you that because that's generally the idea. We want to have uh, a group of domains that make uh, this thing called a tree and then a group of trees to make this thing called a forest. But let me help you visualize this a little bit more. I'm gonna, uh, so I'm going to open up another drawing here. All right. And we'll just start out with uh, this, this single triangle here. The single triangle is going to represent uh, my examlabpractice.com name. All right, so examlabpractice.com. All right, so at that point, is say this company just got started. This company's just starting up. It's a single domain, but when you set the domain up, it's a domain, a tree, and a forest all rolled into one, okay? Not a very big tree, not a very big forest, but it is a domain tree and a forest. So the question now would be, why would you move into having multiple domains? So there's multiple reasons why you would go to having multiple domains, okay? Uh, one reason would be um, administrative purposes because your company is spread out through large amounts of geographical locations. For example, my examlabpractice.com part of my company might be based in the United States. Maybe that's where the company got started and all of that. But the company is expanding and growing. It's, it's moving to different countries in the world. For, for example, maybe, maybe we've got a, a location that is over in the UK. All right, so we'll put another, we'll draw another little triangle here. This other little triangle is going to represent the United Kingdom. All right, and so uh, maybe we've also got another location in Japan. So our, our company has spread out to other geographic uh, regions, other parts of the world. And so um, I'm going to call this domain UK, but when you do that, when it becomes what's known as a child domain, because it's going to be underneath this exam lab practice name, it's going to be called uk.examlabpractice.com. All right. And then if this is going to be the Japan domain, it's going to be called uh, JP. We'll say JP just to be for short, examlabpractice.com, all right? And then these are child domains. They'll have these lines here that are going to represent what are known as trust relationships. Trust relationships allow our domains to share resources together. So uh, these domains here can all exchange and share resources. Now, believe it or not, uh, now you have domain admins that are in control of the UK, but they can only control the UK. You have domain admins, Japan can only control Japan. We have domain admins at examlabpractice.com that can only control examlabpractice.com. Although we can have what are called enterprise administrators that can control the whole thing. Okay, child domains can even have other child domains. So if I wanted to, I could have another triangle maybe underneath uh, the UK here and we'll call that, uh, maybe it's Scotland. So we'll say scotland.uk.examlabpractice.com. All right, so this is, you know, getting into a bigger organization where you want to have lots of domains. And I will tell you that the more domains you have, the bigger the headache a lot of times. But ultimately, um, if you need to give full-blown admin control over the, uh, the different uh, areas of the world, using domains to do that as opposed to something known as an OU might be a better way to do it. Now, I'm not getting into organizational units right now. I'll just say this, that generally speaking, uh, when you start brand getting into different branches, uh, areas of the world, you got different languages you're dealing with, different time zones. It's a lot of times it's a good idea to just let the, the admins in those areas of the world have their own domain. But the beauty is these lines here, these trust relationships, they still allow us to uh, share resources together, okay? Um, so right now, what you're actually looking at is you're looking at four domains. One, two, three, four. You're looking at one tree and one forest. This is not two trees. It's not, a, not two forests. This whole thing is one tree. How do I know that these domains are part of the same tree? Because they share the parent's name. If they share the parent's name, which is examlabpractice.com, then they are part of the tree. Okay, now, when would you go to multiple trees? You would go to multiple trees when there is a namespace change. So, for example, if we had, a, we had another uh, part of our, our company that had a different naming convention 
of some sort, then um, we would expand out to that other uh, that other name. Okay. For example, um, I've got examlabpractice.com, and maybe I'm going to call this uh, this other domain. I'll call it prepare for exams now.com and and again I don't really uh, own that domain name I'm just using that as an example so it won't do you a whole lot of good to go to that domain name right now because it doesn't really I don't really have any control over it but I'm just using this as an example so then we got another triangle here all right another domain let me just maneuver that a little bit better all right we'll put it right here now what happens is, is that you have a trust relationship that connects those triangles together. So now you're actually looking at uh, another tree. So when you have a different domain name that you want to use, that is a different tree. All right. And then from there, if I wanted to have a child domain underneath that, I could. For example, perhaps maybe uh, we've got prepare for exams now.com we have a location that is stored over in Australia so maybe I call it au dot um, prepare for exams now.com and I'll have to move this up a little bit just to because I don't have enough room I'll just maneuver this a little bit better hang on all right and we'll just put the domain name down here like that all right, and so that indicates now that I've got a total of six domains because there's six triangles, right? There's two trees, okay? So this is a tree, and this is a tree, and then we have one forest, okay? So that's how that works, okay? Now, in order for domains to truly be part of the same um, forest, they must be born into that forest. You must bring them up. You must join them at the time you, uh, uh, the domain must, you must have started this domain first, and then when you bring the, this into existence, you would, you would join it into the domain. You can't, uh, already have this created and join, um, and truly be part of the same forest. You may say, wait a minute, now what happens if this company already existed and they merged? Well, you can set up something called a trust relationship still, but they're technically two different forests because when domains are part of the same forest, they share the same schema. The schema is part of the Active Directory database that makes up all of the different objects, all the different attributes, okay? So when domains, when domains are part of the same forest they can share the following they can share resources so that's files and folders they can access printers things like that right um, and then they also share the same schema all right these are the object templates and attributes and all of that. And I'm not getting too deep into the schema right now, but basically this involves the actual database itself. Now, when two different companies merge and they've already got Active Directory, like if, if prepare for exam, examsnow.com was another company and they already had their force set up and we merged, they would not be sharing the same schema. We could set up a forest trust between the two and they could share resources, but they would not share the same schema. That means that if you created a special type of object in one forest, it's not going to replicate over to the other forest. Okay. All right. Now, the other thing that, that uh, domains that are part of the same forest will share is they'll share this thing called the global catalog. The global catalog is a part of the Active Directory database that if you're part of the same forest, you share all the, the global catalog. And this is part of what allows domains to search for objects in different domains. So for example, if, uh, if I'm in Scotland and I'm trying to look up somebody's user information over in Australia, I could, I could do that, especially if I needed their contact information or something like that because of this thing called the global catalog that's shared across the entire forest. Okay, not to get too deep into global catalogs right now, I just wanted to give you that basic idea. Okay, so again, just to kind of um, summarize, 
Uh, every domain must be a part of a domain, a tree, and a forest, even a single domain. Okay, you don't. If you can get away with not having multiple domains in your forest, then do it because it's easier to deal with one domain than it is lots of domains. But if you need to expand because maybe you're spread out all over the world, then that's a good reason to go to multiple child domains. Um, from there, these are all part of the same tree. Now, you don't really need to go to a separate tree in your forest unless uh, you have a namespace difference. So, for example, this name here, prepare for exams now, is a different name, a different domain name. We could go to a separate tree for that. You would still only have one root of the forest, though. The very first domain in the forest is called the root of the forest. This is where your enterprise admins are usually created. Enterprise admins have control over the entire forest. Whereas domain admins are user accounts that only have admin rights over just their individual domains. All right? Okay. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a decent little understanding now of domains, trees, and forest. Now something that's important to understand about Active Directory is that Active Directory um, is a database. And, and of course, like a lot of other databases out there, Active Directory has these things called partitions. Um, partitions are used to replicate from one domain controller to the other. But the interesting thing about that is you have to consider not just having multiple domain controllers inside the, the same domain, like I've got my, my diagram here, but also if I had multiple domains. So when you start branching out to having you know, multiple child domains and multiple trees and, and discussing kind of how replication is going to occur uh, across those multiple domain controllers when they're spread out like that. Um, so I want to draw a little something out for you now just kind of help you visualize and understand the, the concept of the different um, partitions that we have in a Microsoft domain. So uh, here we are um, with another drawing and I am going to let's say that this is your domain controller right here. So we got domain controller and that domain controller is um, has got a database on it. Of course that database is Active Directory. So let me just make this big cylinder here and this cylinder is going to represent our uh, Active Directory database, okay? Um, okay, in the uh, Active Directory database, let's see, Active Directory DB, uh, the name of that database is actually in a file called ntds.dit, okay? So that's actually where your database is stored. It's stored inside of a file called uh, ntds.dit on your domain controller. So the Active Directory database, uh, originally many years ago when Windows 2000 came out, there was really only um, about three real partitions that made up Active Directory, okay? Um, and it was these first three here, and I'll tell you what this fourth one is in just a moment, okay? So the first one is a partition called the config partition, also known as the configuration partition, all right? Now, the configuration partition the thing to understand about it is that this partition will replicate to every single domain controller in the entire forest. I don't care if you've got a single domain or you've got, you've got 50 domains. A copy of this information replicates forest-wide. So it contains info about how the forest is laid out, all right, is, uh, we'll say, configured, all right. Uh, and it replicates forest-wide. So every domain controller in the forest gets a copy of this partition, all right? Which also means that you don't want to somehow mess that up because you're going to mess it up for the entire forest, all right? Uh, the next partition is called the schema partition. And the schema partition uh, is actually a partition that, oops, is a partition that makes up all of the uh, object types and attributes for the entire forest. Okay, so what exactly is that? Well, every time Active Directory goes to create something, if you're going to create a user account or a group or an organizational unit, I don't care what it is, Active Directory uh, communicates with this partition known as the schema, 
and that's how it knows how to build that object. So when I go to create a user, it's got to go to the schema to know how to build it. It's sort of like made up of all the templates. I always use the analogy of it's like imagine this big massive box in your head and in that box says the word schema on the front of it and then inside that box is a bunch of rolled up uh, blueprints. Kind of like the type of uh, blueprints that you might build a house with or something. Okay, <clears throat> And each one of those blueprints is labeled after an Active Directory object like user account, group account, group policy object, organizational unit. And so when you go to create something, Active Directory goes and it pulls out that blueprint and it knows how to build that object. So the schema is made up of all the different objects and the attributes that go with those objects on how to build objects. So it doesn't store any information about the object. It doesn't store like what the user's name is or password or any of that. It just knows how to build the object. Okay, that's what the, uh, the schema partition contains. All right, so it contains all um, object templates and attributes for building objects. This also replicates forest wide. So every single domain controller in the forest is going to have a replica copy of the schema. Okay. The third partition is called the domain partition and the domain partition is unique for every domain. So every domain gets their own copy of this partition uh, and, and they can add their own objects to it. So this is where all of your user accounts, your passwords, your groups, your organiza organizational units are all stored here and they're unique for the domain that you're, uh, you're dealing with. So if you look back here, um, every single domain in this forest has their own unique par uh, domain partition. Okay, it's not a shared partition across the forest. They've each got their own unique portion, okay, of this partition. All right, and so this is where all of your different object information is uh, is stored. So contains all domain related um, objects, object information for just this domain. Replicates only to DCs in this domain. All right, so it contains all domain-related object information for just this domain, and it replicates only to DCs in this domain. So, all right, it does not replicate across the forest like some of these other, um, other ones do, okay? All right, so that's important. Now, guys, when uh, this came out uh, in the year 2000, that was it. There was only three partitions that existed. Microsoft, um, when Server 2003 Active Directory came out, they released the ability to create um, a fourth partition called an application partition. Now, an act application partition, this is a custom partition, okay, that you can create and you can choose what's going to get stored in there, okay? So you get to choose what's going to get stored inside this partition. Uh, so if your company was doing, you know, developing applications and these applications had created special types of objects in Active Directory and you only wanted certain domain controllers to have a copy of these objects, that's what this is for. It, to be honest with you, it's not really used that often nowadays. It was something I think Microsoft really thought would take off. It didn't really though. Uh, it's not used by a lot of, um, a lot of people out there, though it could be used if you develop custom uh, ob objects that are going to be stored in Active Directory and you wanted to, to pick and choose which DCs are going to uh, replicate this information. So um, this is a custom partition, if I could spell, custom partition that you create and choose which DCs get a copy of the information, okay? So this is a custom partition that you create and choose which DCs get a copy of the information. Now, I will tell you that uh, Active Directory nowadays does come with a couple of these that are built in. Uh, one is called the Forest DNS Zone um, Custom Partition. The other is called the Domain DNS Zone custom partition, and that gets specifically into DNS and how you want DNS to replicate, which I'm not getting into just at the very moment, but 
essentially what it means is that um, if we're uh, if Active Directory is hosting its own DNS, which most people do that, you can choose to replicate your entire DNS information across the forest or just a specific domain. And so there's actually a couple of these that, that uh, tie to Active Directory involving DNS. But ultimately, those are your three main partitions right there. This one is a custom one that you can create. There is a couple of built-in ones that Microsoft uh, has. They don't really advertise this a whole lot, but, but they involve DNS. Now, the last thing that I would like to mention is that you have this thing called the Global Catalog. The Global Catalog is a special job you can assign to a domain controller. And when you do that, it will replicate, it will replicate a subset of all the objects in every domain's domain partition. Okay? I'm going to have to lower the font on that just a little bit so it'll all fit in there. But let me say that again. It replicates a subset of all the objects in every domain, uh, every domain's domain partition. That's this partition right here. Okay, that's this guy. Now, the global catalog, the purpose of it is so that um, our different computers can locate objects in those different domains. So if I come over here, it makes it to where uh, I could be in, say, the Scotland domain, and I could look up a user account that exists in Australia. The global catalog is what makes that possible. It does not replicate all the attributes about every object. It just represents a subset of those objects so that um, the different machines in your domain in Forest can find each other. This doesn't really do a whole lot if you've only got a single domain because your domain controller knows everybody anyway. But if you spread out to multiple domains, uh, like I had in that other diagram, that's where the global catalog is really going to come into play. All right? All right. So hopefully that gives you guys a good understanding now of the different uh, partitions. This is, again, kind of the behind-the-scenes stuff of hacking, happening in Active Directory, but it, hopefully it helps you understand now uh, what these different partitions are used for. We're now ready to go ahead and set up a Microsoft Active Directory domain. So here we are on the NYC DC1 virtual machine uh, running server 2022. And we're going to, um, when you first go into it, you'll notice that it brings you to server manager with this uh, message here. For now, I'm going to close this. Now, if you close out a server manager and you don't know how to get back in, all you got to do is hit start. You'll see server manager right there. You can open that back up and always remember you'll see a little blue bar kind of going by. You want to wait for that blue bar to kind of stop spinning before you do anything in Server Manager else. Sometimes Server Manager will, will throw a message telling you you have to wait. Okay, so um, if you're wanting to set up Active Directory, there's a few things I want to look at. All right, first I want to click on Local Server. And when I click on Local Server, I can see that my computer name is currently this crazy name here. Okay. And I would like to change that name. I'm going to um, use a different name instead. So we're going to go ahead and click that and then um, that name. And then I'm going to click change. I'm just going to call this uh, NYC DC1. All right. Um, and currently I am part of a work group. If I was going to join a domain, then I would choose domain. But in my case, I'm going to be starting a domain creating a domain. So we're just going to leave that alone. We're going to call it NYCDC1. All right, I'm going to click OK. It's going to tell me that I need to reboot my computer. Now before I reboot my computer, I'm going to say restart later. I'm going to take a look at my uh, IP information. So uh, from there you'll notice I have Ethernet. It says IPv4. I'm going to click on that. All right, and I'm going to now right click my Ethernet adapter, go to properties, and I've got TCP IP version 4. Okay, for now, I'm just going to disable version 6. I don't want version 6 uh, interfering with anything. I'm just going to disable it for now. I'm going to go to properties on version 4. And um, now, in the real world, normally I'm going to go with the static address and all that. The problem is, is if anybody's doing this with me, I don't know what your static IP information is for the network you're on. So I'm just going to leave this set to obtain. But for the DNS, I'm going to point to 127.0.0.1. Which you 
you understand basic network concepts, you may know that that's called the loopback address, and it basically allows the computer to point to itself for DNS. Keep in mind that while we're doing this, our server will not have any kind of internet access, but that's okay for what we're doing right now. So we're gonna click okay, and we're gonna click close, all right? And we are now officially ready to reboot our computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and reboot the machine. So I'm gonna right click start, shut down, restart, and then I'm gonna pause the video while it restarts. Okay, the restart is complete. I've logged back on and I'm back in server manager. I'm gonna to go to this uh, manage uh, menu option here and click Add Roles and Features. Okay, all right, so this is the welcome uh, Add Roles and Features wizard. Essentially what it's gonna do is allow me to install different roles and features onto my server. So it's just giving me some information here. I'm gonna click Next. It's asking me if this is gonna be a role-based or feature installation. If I'm doing something involving remote desktop, I'm gonna choose this first option because it is a role-based, feature-based installation. From there, it's going to let me select if I'm just installing this on one server. Right now it's just this one server. If I had a, a group of, of Windows servers, I could actually uh, have multiple servers that I install on at the same time. Okay, But in my case, I'm actually just installing on this one machine for now. So I'm going to click Next on that. And then from there, I can choose what I want. Okay, So to install Active Directory, the first thing that needs to happen is we need to install Active Directory Domain Services. So this is this first little option right here. We're going to select that option, click uh, Add Features, and we're now officially ready to start installing Active Directory. So before we can configure our domain and set our domain up and all that stuff, the first thing we got to do is we've got to install ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services. So we're going to click Next. There's no additional features. We're just gonna have the ADDS, the Active Directory Domain Services role installed. There's no additional features I'm gonna install at this very moment. I'm gonna click Next. All right, at that point, it's gonna tell us that, hey, you know, you can link this to Azure Active Directory in the cloud. I'm gonna not gonna get into that just this very moment. Right now, we just want to install the on-premise version of Active Directory on this machine. So we're gonna click Next, and we're gonna click Install and I'm gonna pause the video while that's installing. I've now got the Active Directory Domain Services role installed. I'm gonna hit close and up at the top of the screen you'll notice there's a little yellow exclamation mark. I'm gonna click that yellow, little yellow exclamation mark and I'm gonna click promote this server to a domain controller. Okay, all right, so in our case um, we are gonna be setting up a whole new forest, all right? Um, a force being a, a group of domains and you can have a single domain that creates what's called a force. A lot of people think you have to have lots of domains for it to be a force or at least two. A single domain can actually have a force. But just to look at these other options real quick, you'll notice the first option says add a domain controller to an existing domain. So if I was going to, if I already had a domain and I wanted to add this uh, server to an existing domain, and be a domain controller for that domain, I would choose that first option. The second option says add a new domain to an existing forest. All right, so that means I'm gonna set up a whole new domain that's gonna be part of a forest. In my case, I don't even have a forest, so I need to start a forest. So we're gonna say add a new forest. All right, and so what's the, the root domain? It's gonna be examlabpractice.com. This is my little domain I'm setting up uh, to demonstrate with. So I'm going to click Next. At that point, it says, all right, what's the functional level of your uh, forest? Not to get too deep into functional levels this very minute, but the idea of a functional level is uh, as time has gone on over the years of Active Directory coming out, they've released new features. Now, your Active Directory is really only as up-to-date as its oldest domain controller. So you're kind of pinpointing what level your new domain is going to operate at. As you can see, I can go to my forest, can go all the way from 2008 or higher, my domain. It's going to make me do my domain at 2016 because the, the, I've only got one uh, domain controller at this point, and it's, and it's going to be a 2022 server and that's the latest functional level. So they haven't added any more functional levels since Windows Server 2016 has come out. This is the reason why there's not another, uh, a newer functional level. 
So as time has gone on, there have been new features that have been added, and essentially I'm telling my Active Directory just how up-to-date it can be. Okay, so if you had a group of domains like in a forest and maybe one of the domains was running server 2008 or something as a domain controller, you would have to choose that. It's really only domain controllers that matter when it comes to functional levels. So I could have, right now, I can be 2016 server functional level for my domain and have like a, you know, I could still have a server 2008 um, server in my domain as long as it's not a domain controller. From there, uh, so specify your domain capabilities, domain controller capabilities. I want to have DNS installed. This server is going to host DNS for my domain. You absolutely must have a DNS server set up. And the second thing is the global catalog. The global catalog is a special server that's going to replicate amongst all the domains in your force. It's going to replicate certain types of things like universal groups and things like that. Not to get too deep into global catalog servers right now, but that's the idea. It's a special type of server, that a domain controller that's going to replicate amongst multiple uh, domains in a forest if we had multiple domains. Now, in our case, we've only got one domain, so it's not a big deal. And then you could choose RODC. Of course, I can't set up a RODC, a read-only domain controller, unless I've actually set up the domain. So this is completely grayed out. Uh, I'm not going to get deep into RODC right now either. So um, understand that some things are going to get explained a little bit later. Okay. So here we go. Then it wants to know the DSRM password. That is the Directory Services Restore Mode Administrator password. This password is used if you need to restore Active Directory from backup. So you're definitely going to want to remember this password. Okay, I'm just going to enter in a password now. And it is possible later down the road if you want to change this password, you can. Okay, so I'm going to click Next. All right, at that point it says the delegation for DNS can't be found. That's because DNS is not installed on this server yet, but Active Directory should take care of all this for us. So that's fine. We're going to go ahead and click Next to that. Then it's going to say, what do you want your NetBIOS name to be? All right, so your NetBIOS name is an old legacy name for older devices that need to be able to interact with your domain. Hopefully, we don't have any older devices in our domain. When I say older devices, I'm talking about like 1990s devices. They would utilize, uh, instead of DNS, they would utilize what was known as NetBIOS names. NetBIOS names can only be up to 15 characters in link. So the reason why we're, we're using this is just in case we had some older devices in our environment. To be honest with you, in the real world, it's a good idea, once you set this up, to just completely disable NetBIOS altogether if you don't have any older devices because it is a bit of a security risk to continuously allow NetBIOS naming. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and click Next. All right, and it's going to go through and just double check and make sure that there isn't a conflict out there on our network, and there is not. So the next thing is it's going to ask us where our database and logs are going to be. So the Active Directory database is stored in a file called ntds.dit, and that gets stored by default on the C drive slash Windows NTDS folder. Your logs are as well. You have what are known as database transaction logs that log every single thing that's going on in the Active Directory database. And you've got what's called a sysvol folder. The sysvol folder is where group policy information and logon scripts are stored. It's actually, if you want better performance out of your computer, out of your domain controller, it's actually a good idea to store your database and logs on a separate hard drive. So put your database on one hard drive, put your logs on another hard drive. If you have two hard drives in your server, you'll get a, a, a slightly better performance uh, boost out of your database and log interaction. All right. All right, so now I'm going to click Next to that. And it's going to tell me everything it's going to do. Now, I would like to point out, too, you can, you can see what it's doing. It's actually going to use PowerShell in the background to install Active Directory. So if we click View Script, you can see the uh, PowerShell command that's actually being ran. Import-module ADDS deployment. So it's pulling the Active Directory deployment commands into memory. It's running the install-ADDS forest command, meaning you're setting up a new forest. It's calling the create DNS delegation parameter false. I'm not delegating anything here for DNS. It's actually installing DNS on this machine. The database, it's specifying the database path with this, with this parameter, specifying the, the domain mode. It's basically going with the highest functional mode. That's what that's doing. You have the domain name, examlabpractice.com, uh, the NetBIOS name, the forest 
It's using the latest functional level for the force, just like it is for the domain. Um, it's installing DNS set to true, specifying the log path. It says no reboot on completion, false. Okay, so it's a no reboot. And then it's installing the sysfall folder here, and it's going to go ahead and force it just to, if, if it pops any message up, just force it to say true to that. So that's going to be the PowerShell command. You could copy it, copy this PowerShell command to something like the integrated scripting environment. You could run this as like a cookie cutter on multiple machines if you wanted to. Granted, you don't want any kind of conflict, but if you wanted to set up multiple domains for practice, you could do that if you needed to. All right, so I'm going to go ahead now and click Next. It's going to verify all the prerequisites are met and let me know if there's any kind of uh, error messages or anything like that or any kind of warnings that that it's ran across it's going to let me know uh, anything there okay so Windows domain controllers they tell you have default security settings allow cryptography algorithms compatible with Windows NT that's basically telling you that it is going to support an older type of encryption to allow old NT server from the 1990s to interact with the domain uh, it's in your best interest from a security standpoint. You can control these through policies. You can disable some of that to increase security. So the next message is this computer has at least one physical network adapter, but that does not have a static address. Now in the real world, you would want your domain controller to have a static address so the address doesn't change, ideally. Um, I already mentioned, though, earlier that I don't really know what kind of address that uh, if you're doing this with me, I don't know what your address is for your network. So in my case, I chose to use a, a dynamic address, which means it'll get an address from the DHCP uh, service on your network, which is fine for lab purposes. The main thing is we want to make sure we're pointing to ourselves for DNS, and that's what this little message here is involving. It's telling you that DNS is not set up. However, Active Directory is going to install DNS for us so that we, uh, we have a database going. All right, so from there it says the prerequisites are complete and um, we are ready to, to install. It says everything's passed successfully, so we're ready to install. I'm going to go ahead and click the install button. And uh, this is going to take just a moment. I'm going to pause the video and let it uh, finish up. Okay, after the wizard uh, completes the installation, the domain controller will reboot. And at that point, you'll come to your logon screen here, and you'll notice it says exam lab practice slash administrator. That means I'm logging on to the domain as opposed to the local user account. I'm just going to go ahead now and put my password in, and it's going to officially log me on to the domain controller. Okay, I'm now back in Server Manager after I log on. Let's just verify a few things. We're going to click on Local Server. All right, from there, we're going to notice that computer name is NYCDC1, domain is examlabpractice.com. Okay, we're going to go to the Tools menu, and we're going to open up DNS, and we're just going to verify that our DNS database is there. Okay, so NYCDC1, for lookup zones, examlabpractice.com. That's exactly what we want to see right there. We want to see that database. And then if we click on the underscore TCP and UDP, we have service records that are created. These records are needed uh, in order for the Active Directory services to run properly. And so everything seems to be in order. We now have, if we go up to the tools menu, we have our Active Directory tools, such as Active Directory users and computers, where we create user accounts and all that fun stuff. So our domain controller is now officially set up. It's now time to join our second server to our Microsoft domain. So we have NYCDC1, which is up and running right now um as a domain controller and we have nyc server one that is currently not a member of any domain so let's take a look at that server right now uh, here we are on um, nyc server one and i'm just going to hit start all right and from there we'll go to server manager first thing we're going to do is take a look at the name of the server okay not going to get into the windows admin center right now Wait on the little bar to quit spinning by here in Server Manager. Once that's done, I'm going to click on Server uh, Local Server. So you can see the name is um, this name here. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to go ahead and change the name. So I'm going to call it NYC SVR1. Okay, 
I'm gonna I'm going to go ahead now and let the computer reboot before I try to join the domain. I've had some issues in the past with doing that, so we're just gonna go ahead and tell it to restart. Okay, after it rebooted, I've logged back on and server manager reappears. I'm gonna close that, go over to local server, and notice the name is now NYC SVR1, but I'm still part of a work group. Now, this is very important. Um, in order for me to join the domain, I need to make sure that my DNS settings on this machine are pointed to the domain controller because the domain controller is our DNS server that's, that is, is going to be needed in order for me to join the domain. So I'm going to jump over to NYC DC1. So here we are. This is NYC DC1. I'm going to open up Server Manager um, and I'm going to go Tools and I'm going to go to actually you know what I'm gonna go to command prompt so I'm gonna type CMD go to command prompt type IP config okay and that is my IP address 192.168.1.5 if you're doing this with me as well you need to find out what your IP address is and you need to write that number right there down okay whatever it is I don't know what it is for you but for me it's 192.168.1.5 okay so once I've got that written down I'm gonna jump back over to server one so here we are we're back on server one okay we're gonna go right here on local server uh, ethernet ipv4 okay we're gonna right click the ethernet adapter okay i'm gonna disable ipv6 on it highlight v4 ip tcp ip version 4 go to properties and i'm gonna point to 192.168.1.5 1 so again that should match what you've got on your your uh, domain control right now so um, unlike we're not going to put 127.001 like we did for our domain controller because we're not pointing to ourselves. we want to point to the domain controller from there we're going to click OK we're going to click close alright we can close out of this screen and we're now ready to join the domain okay so currently on local server you see we're part of a work group we're going to click where it says work group right there alright we're going to click right here where it says change and we're going to switch to a domain. We're going to put examlabpractice.com. That's what I'm putting because that's what my domain is called. In your case, you may have a different domain. You would need to put in whatever that name is. I'm going to click OK. OK, it wants to know what my credentials are. I'm going to put exam lab practice backslash administrator. And then I'm going to put the password in. If everything went through successfully, you should get this message here welcome to the domain you gotta make sure again that you're pointing to the domain controller for DNS that is critical alright that's where most everybody messes up is they don't point their selves to the domain to the domain controller they point to their ISP for DNS or whatever and at that point it's not gonna work you gotta point to the domain controller for DNS at that point we're gonna click OK we're gonna click close we're gonna tell it to restart and I'll pause the video while it's restarting Okay, so once it's done restarting, you may come to a screen like this. I'm going to say other user, though, and then I'm going to put exam lab practice slash administrator, backslash administrator. This is going to let me log on to the domain administrator account instead of the local administrator account. We're going to hit enter, and it's now officially logging us on to the exam lab practice domain and I've officially uh, joined the server to the domain. We can go now over to Active Directory um, on our domain controller and we can verify that the server is showing up in our Active Directory environment. So we're gonna jump back over to NYC DC1. Okay, so here's NYC DC1, as you can see. All right, I'm gonna go uh, up here to, I'm in Server Manager, I'm gonna go to Tools Active Directory Users and Computers. All right, expand out the examlabpractice.com name. I'm going to click on Computers, and you guys can see NYC Server 1 is showing up. Remember, NYC Server 1 in this case is not a domain controller at the moment. It is just a member server. All right, the only domain controller we've got in our environment right now is NYC DC1. Okay, and we can see that by clicking on this little um, domain controller's organizational unit, OU. All right, and then there's NYC Server 1. All right, so we've officially joined the domain and we've got the two machines able to communicate together. I'd now like to convert NYC 
server one to a domain controller. And even though I did call it NYC server one, I'm gonna leave the name the same, but it is going to now be promoted to a, an additional domain controller in my examlabpractice.com domain. Now, if I open up server manager, okay, open up server manager, um, from there, uh, I've actually already installed ADDS. And if you don't know how to do that, you just do that through manage, add roles and features, next, next, next. And then you choose Active Directory Domain Services and then it's gonna install, okay, once that's done. Once, so once you've done that, at that point, we're gonna promote. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna say promote the server to a domain controller. We're gonna say add a domain controller to an existing domain, all right? Keep in mind, if I wanted to set up a, another a child domain of the forest, I could, or a whole new forest, I could. Okay, so I'm gonna go with that option. Okay, from there it says specify domain controller capabilities and site information. If I want, I could uh, install this as a DNS server. Uh, I'm not gonna do that, I'm just gonna point to NYC DC1 as my DNS. So I'm gonna turn that off. And then if I wanna make this a global catalog server, I can, I'll just leave that selected. I'm not gonna make this a ROD-C. Okay, um, it is, there's only one site that all this belongs to. I'm, I'm not really explaining sites a whole lot right now. That's going to represent the geographic location of where this is at, but not getting into sites at this very moment. Okay, going to put in the directory services restore mode password. This is the uh, password that we would use to recover Active Directory if we needed to. Going to click next. It says, okay, you're going to set up the domain controller. You're going to replicate from any domain controller or from NYCDC1. Well, there's only one other domain controller, so really doesn't matter what option I choose here. Now I can do install for media. If I had a backed up copy of Active Directory, like on a USB drive or something, I could install for media. And again, this, the reason why this is good is in a situation where perhaps your, um, your, you had a really slow connection and you had a copy of Active Directory backed up and you had a very large Active Directory database and you don't want it to replicate across that slow connection, the whole thing you can install from media. That's not a, an, an option that's used very often, but it could come in handy in certain uh, circumstances. So from there, we'll click next. I'm gonna leave the database log and sysfall folder in the, in the default location. We're gonna review options. We could look at our, um, our uh, PowerShell command here, as you can see. And then from there, I'm gonna click next. It's gonna check the prerequisites and everything is clear. We're gonna go ahead and click install and I'll pause the video while that's happening and finish up. Okay, so now uh, Active Directory is officially set up on this machine. It's been promoted now to a domain controller. Keep in mind when the wizard finished, it did a reboot. So if you do this uh, along with me, you'll notice that you'll have to reboot your domain controller and then you can log back on and you'll be where I'm at. So at that point, I now should be able to click tools. I should be able to go into Active Directory users and computers and I can view Active Directory just like I can on NYC DC1. All right, there we go. And instead of only seeing one domain controller in the domain controllers OU, you guys can see that I now have two. I have NYC DC1 and I have NYC Server 1, okay? So we officially uh, have our domain controller set up on this other machine and uh, NYC Server 1 is now officially a domain controller. I want to talk now about a concept known as FISMO roles. Now, FISMO, F-S-M-O, stands for Flexible Single Master Operations. Now, this is a feature that has been part of Active Directory since the very beginning when Active Directory came out in the year 2000. Now, what this has to do with is before Active Directory came out in the year 2000, back when it was Windows NT, uh, and we had what were called PDCs and BDCs. The PDCs, the primary domain controller, was a domain controller that was writable. All other domain controllers were read-only. When Windows 2000 came out, Microsoft made the move to make all your domain controllers writable. Okay? Of course, fast forward down the road a little ways, they came out with what was called a ROD-C, but let's just focus on writable domain controllers for just a moment. Now, um, the, the problem with that is, is that it's great and wonderful to think, well, I can have uh, um, changes that are going to be made to my domain controllers, like right here, and then uh, very quickly thereafter, those changes can replicate over to here. And that's, that's great. I can modify users and groups and things like that, and replication will occur. 
But the issue you run into is there are certain jobs that Active Directory domain controllers have that you just can't have multiple writable copies of these jobs because it can cause conflicts. Now, these jobs, there's actually five of these, and so there are five flexible single master operation roles, okay? Two of these roles are what we call forest level roles, and the other three are what we call domain level roles, okay? So to begin with, let's look at our forest level roles, and I'll name those off. So the first one is called the domain naming master, all right, and the second one is called the schema master. So you have the domain naming master and you have the schema master. Those are your two domain level roles. Now, those two particular roles, you will only have one writable copy of those two roles for your forest, okay? So I'm gonna put the letter F inside this little server. It's gonna represent a DC and that's gonna represent a forest level role Okay, and you will only have, you will have one writable copy of those two roles for your whole entire forest. And ordinarily, that writable copy would be in the root of your forest. That's where it all kind of starts out, and that is generally where you would keep those. So the root of my forest is examlabpractice.com. That would be where those two roles would reside. Now, can the two roles reside on the same domain controller? Absolutely. And in some cases, it's a good idea to do that, um, although you can spread a couple, some of them out to get better performance. In fact, just so you know, all five roles will start out on the very first domain controller that starts the domain. So in my case, where I've set up a, a domain controller called NYCDC1, all five roles are on that server right now. But my point is, is that yes, you can keep the roles together, you can spread them out, okay? So then you have the schema master to go with that domain naming master. There's two of them here. You have the domain naming master and the schema master. Those are your two forest level roles, all right? Uh, now, what do they do exactly? So the domain naming master, its job is it, it uh, it handles the configuration partition of Active Directory. It knows about all the trust relationships in the forest. It also makes sure that all of your domain names are unique. So every single domain has to be, every single domain in the forest has to be unique, as well as it keeps track of the trust relationships and, and how all that is, is linked together. The next is the scheming, schema master. The schema master is made up of the actual master copy of the schema database. The schema database is made up of all of the objects and attributes for the entire force. Every time Active Directory goes to create something, it has to go to the schema to know how to build whatever it's going to create. Whether it's a user, a group, a, a computer account, GPO, group policy object, whatever it is, it's got to have an object in that schema to know how to build it. So you have a master writable copy of the schema database and it's stored on that domain controller. Okay, so then we have the three domain level FISMO roles. Okay, the three domain level FISMO roles are the RID master. Okay, you have the infrastructure master. Okay, and then lastly you have the PDC emulator master. Let me just fix that. There we go. And then finally the PDC emulator master. Okay, and those are your three domain level FISMO roles, all right? Now, interestingly enough, and I'm just gonna create another little icon to kind of represent those, all right? And let me just move this out a little bit. So this little icon I'm making is gonna represent my domain level FISMO roles, and again, there are a total of three of those grand total of three of those, all right? And we'll just stack them on there like that. And the interesting thing about those is you will have a copy of those in every domain in your forest. So every domain in the forest gets their own copy of those three roles, okay? There's only one copy, writable copy for the forest level roles. There are, um, 
you know, a copy of all of the domain level roles in every domain in the forest, okay? Now, do they have to be all on the same, on different machines, or can they be on the same machines? Again, they can all be on the same machines, although there is some, some benefits to separating the PD Simulator Master and RID Master. There's some performance considerations there, but ultimately, you could keep them all on the same server, all right? Of course, you may say, well, you know, what happens if... Uh, all of them, uh, what if the whole server dies and I lose all five roles? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the, the interesting thing I want you to be aware of is that um, you have a read-only copy of all of these roles on every one of your domain controllers. Every one of your domain controllers has a read-only copy of all five of these roles. So interestingly enough, you can, you can recover. So there's this thing called transferring that'll let you transfer the roles over to another uh, to domain controller. So if you want to separate them, you can do what's called transferring. But if you ever want to convert a read-only version to the writable version, that's called seizing. So you can transfer if, uh, if you need to. You would transfer a role in a scenario where um, domain controllers haven't gone down. So if you just want to move the role to a different domain controller, you can. But if you, if a domain controller dies that has that role on it and you need to convert a read-only copy to the writable copy because the original died, that's called seizing, okay? So again, we've got all five. Um, we could have all five of the roles on the same box or we could, we could separate them, okay? And of course, you're only going to have all five on the same box if, uh, if you're talking about the root domain probably because you're your forest level FISMO roles uh, will gen generally stay in the root. But again, all five of these roles, there's at least a read-only copy on every domain controller. Okay, so what do these other roles do? Well, you have the RID master. The RID master hand is what's known as the relative ID master. See, every object in Active Directory gets this thing called a SID and, and RID. Um, and the SID is a secure identifier. A RID is a unique identifier for the domain. Essentially, what it involves is every object must have a unique identifier to identify that object in the domain and in the forest. So that's what the RID master does. The RID master is in charge of giving out these, um, these IDs to your object. So what happens is, is that your, uh, your RID master is going to give um, what's called a, a RID pool out. It's going to give a block of these IDs out to every domain controller, and every domain controller can issue those out to different objects that it's creating. The RID master's job, too, is to make sure that there's no objects in the domain that have the same ID. Okay, so this is what the RID master is going to do. Very important job to make sure that um, every object has, your, has an ID. All right. Um, and other than just a name, because you can't have some names that are the same in Active Directory, but the RID master makes sure that everything has an underlying ID, okay? Security and relative ID. So then you've got the infrastructure master. The infrastructure master handles what are known as group to user references. So as we start working with groups and we give permission across to different domains, we're going to be occasionally linking one group to give permission to another group, for example, or to another area of, of our force. For example, I could, I could give a group in the um, Scotland domain, I could give it access to a resource in the, or I'm sorry, the UK domain could be given access to a resource in Scotland. The infrastructure master is going to help handle this uh, group to user references between the domains. So that's what this job is. The last one is a PD simulator master. Um, this guy has a lot of jobs. Number one, uh, he handles password uh, changes. So when you make changes to password, the PD Simulator Master is, the, is uh, gonna immediately find out about a password reset. So if there's ever any conflicts between, like let's say if somebody changes their password um, on, on, in a certain area, and then like let's say they're in Dallas, Texas, and they change their password, and they, they hop on a plane and fly to uh, New York City, and they log on, and replication hasn't occurred between Dallas and New York, well, that would cause a problem, right? The password wouldn't be in sync. Well, it's not a problem, because whenever somebody puts a password in, if the password isn't, doesn't, isn't correct, the domain controller you're authenticating with will call upon the PDC Emulator Master to find out if the PDC Emulator Master has an update on passwords, because what happens is when somebody resets their password, the PD Simulator Master is notified immediately there's been a password change. So 
that's a pretty important job. The PD Simulator Master also would act as a PDC for old NT uh, servers that were in your domain. It's not really a job that hopefully you have to deal with anymore, but that's one of the jobs it performed. And uh, it also handles time synchronization. Now this is important because Active Directory uses a, a security protocol called Kerberos and the PD Simulator Master is going to keep everything in sync on time for the sake of Kerberos. Kerberos will only give a five minute leeway period if your machines are out of sync on time. And by the way, the time zone doesn't affect that. But what, what you don't want is for your computers to all be out of sync on time. So the PC Emulator Master is going to be in charge of that. And lastly, the other thing he does is he handles um, GPOs, Group Policy Objects. The master writable copy of your group policies, which are very important things in a domain, are handled through him. So again, he handles password changes, okay? He handles time sync, okay? He handles GPOs, and he also handles legacy uh, NT boxes. He acts as a PDC for those legacy NT boxes. So he's got a, a bunch of important jobs. A lot of times when you know people set up a domain, they think, oh, well, I don't need a PDC emulator because I don't have any legacy boxes, legacy NT boxes in my environment anymore. Well, that's the least of the things that that server actually does, um, is, is the whole handle legacy authentication and all that. So these are all very important jobs, of course, that your uh, environment is going to handle. All right, um, And remember that all of your domain controllers have at least a read-only copy of all five of those jobs. Um, your domain is going to start out with all five of them. The writable copy on all five will be on the DC. And then you can transfer these if you want to transfer them off. Okay, But right now, I just wanted to get this concept of, of uh, the difference between force level and domain and help you understand a little bit about each one of these. I now want to take a look at how we can see uh, which machines are our FISMO roles, our flexible single master operation roles. Okay. So um, here I am on NYC DC1, and you can see uh, your FISMO roles in different places. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to have, I'm going to go to, is I'm going to open up Server Manager. All right, I'm going to go to the Tools menu. All right, and we will take a look at Active Directory Users and Computers. So we're going to go ahead and click on Active Directory Users and Computers. All right, we're going to load that tool up. And you're going to notice that all three of your domain level FISMO roles can be found by, uh, by right-clicking examlabpractice.com. In other words, right-click your domain object in Active Directory Users and Computers, and you'll see Operation Masters. Okay, from there you can see RID, PDC, and Infrastructure Master. So all three are, uh, can be located right through this graphical tool. All right. Now, if we close out of that and we go to Tools, Active Directory, Domains, and Trusts, we right click uh, uh, right here, we'll right click Active Directory, Domains, and Trusts. Once we get in there, we'll click on Operations Master. You guys can see that this is where the Domain Naming Master is managed. Okay. Now, the last one is the Schema Master. There's only one problem. We don't actually have the Schema tool to, to actually uh, look at that one. Okay, so if we want to see the the schema master, none of these tools, uh, as you can see here, are going to let us look at that. That's because Microsoft has actually hidden the schema tool from you. They don't actually want you to be able to jump right in and, and look at that. You actually have to register a, a DLL file in order to do it. So if I actually go right here and I go right click the start button and I click run, I'm going to I'm going to type reg svr32 that's reg svr32 hit the space bar and then i'm going to type schmmgmt.dll so that's reg svr space schmmgmt okay now before i run that i want to show you something if i type mmc.exe uh, it does help if you don't typo it mmc.exe that's going to bring me into the microsoft management console I can hit the file menu, add and remove snap in, and you guys can see that I do not have the schema tool. The schema tool is going to show up right here once I register it. Okay, so I'm going to close out of that. 
Okay, let's try it again. So right click start, hit run, and then I'm going to type regsvr32 schmmgmt.dll, hit enter. Okay, you're going to get a DLL succeeded message. Now I should be able to go into the MMC, go to the file menu, add remove snap in, and look what shows up magically. Active Directory Schema. So I can add that tool. Okay, there's the Active Directory Schema. So here's a look at the schema. Okay, I'm going to right click Active Directory Schema, Operation Master, and there you have it. Okay, so NYCDC1 is the schema, is the, the master of all these roles. All right, so what if you want to, to move a role? So if a master, if your Operation Masters are up and running, and they haven't gone down unexpectedly, and you just want to move a role, you can transfer it. Okay, you can transfer it graphically using this button here, um, or you can actually use PowerShell, or there's a command called ntdsutil that'll let you do it, which I'll show you the commands in a minute. But notice that I'm not, give, I'm not even being given an option to transfer it to a different machine. That's because you actually need to be on the machine that you want to transfer the role to. Okay, so like for example, let me jump over to NYC Server 1, which is also a domain controller now. We're going to go into Server Manager. We'll go to Tools, and we'll go to Active Directory Users and Computers, and uh, let's, look at one of the, let's look at the three roles that are there, and we'll transfer one of those roles, okay? All right, so here's Active Directory Users and Computers. I'm going to right-click uh, Exam Lab Practice. I'm going to go to Operation Masters, and then from there... Uh, I'm going to choose uh, infrastructure, let's say. So let's transfer the infrastructure master. You'll notice that current infrastructure master is NYC DC1. If I want to transfer it to server 1, I can. So I'm just going to click change. And it says, are you sure? I'm going to say yes. And the role is now being transferred. Okay. So it does take a little time to replicate. But as you can see, it's going to show up as NYC server 1. Let's jump back over to NYC DC1. Go to Tools, Active Directory, Users, and Computers. Okay, so we're on DC1 now. Right-click, Operation Master. Okay, we'll look at Infrastructure. And notice the current role is NYC Server 1. All right, so uh, it has officially been transferred. All right. Now, you can... Uh, Transfer roles if they're up and running. You're going to use the graphical tool to do that, to transfer roles. And then there's also some command line tools. Now, the other thing you do when it comes to troubleshooting and dealing with the uh, FISMA roles is you may have to seize a role. Remember that all domain controllers have at least a read-only copy of all five of these roles. Seizing a role occurs when one of the roles has gone down unexpectedly and there's no signs of it coming back up. You know it's not coming back up. So as a last resort, you do what's called seizing. Seizing is where you're going to convert one of the read-only copies of a role to a writable copy. Okay, so how can we do that? All right. Well, first thing we can do is uh, we can go to command prompt. All right. So open up command prompt start cmd you know go to command prompt like so and you can run this command ntds util ntds util um, if you didn't know active directory when they first created active directory the original name for it was called ntds new technology directory services uh, and that was in the late 90s when active directory was still kind of a beta and then in the year 2000, everything got renamed to Active Directory. So the original four-letter uh, uh, acronym for Active, for Active Directory was not ADDS. It was actually NTDS. So this is why you'll occasionally see references to that older name or that older acronym. So I'm going to hit Enter. Okay, and then I'm going to do a little question mark. And you'll see the commands that are available to me. All right. So from there... You'll see some different options. There's an option called roles. So I'm just going to type roles, R-O-L-E-S, hit enter, and I'm going to do a question mark again, and there it is. This is how you could seize. Um, you could seize the role over to another domain controller. You can convert the read-only copy to the writable. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to do that right now, but you could try that out if you wanted to. Um, let me quit out of this. Okay, the other thing I want to show you is there is a PowerShell command that can be used as well. So if I right-click Start, go to PowerShell, 
there is a command that's called move dash uh, ad directory server operations master role. So move dash ad. Um, hold on, it's catching up. I'm hitting the tab key here. All right, there it is. That big, huge uh, command right there. And then I could specify the identity of uh, that I wanted to um, the of the server. So maybe I want to do NYC SVR one, for example, right. And then the next would be the operation master role that you want to transfer. Okay, so actually I'll show you that there is um, a great idea with PowerShell. Always remember with PowerShell is there's a help article that shows you how to use pretty much every command. Now, you can, you could type get help. All right, get help and then type the command. Um, but I'm a bigger fan of the help article. So if you go out to the internet and just type it into Google, for example, so we just go to Google, we'll just paste it into Google, you'll notice that Microsoft has a help article that will show you exactly how to use pretty much every PowerShell command in existence. So there we go. We'll pull that up. And then from there, you'll see examples on how to use it. So if I wanted to move it, move the PDC Emily role, so identity, then the operation master you want to move. So very easy command to use. So that's another way that you can, you know, you could move a role. If you want to seize the role, here's an example of seizing. Same exact kind of thing, all right? They're seizing, seizing roles here. But you can see the PowerShell command to do that, all right? Okay, hopefully that gives you a much better understanding now of Operation Master Rules, how to move, how to seize, the whole troubleshooting side of things, and, uh, and uh, you're now ready to move on. Now, for years, Windows Server Domain Controllers have supported a feature known as RODC. RODC is a read-only domain controller, uh, and it was kind of funny because uh, back in the 1990s when we had Windows NT Server, you had what was called a PDC, a primary domain controller, and you had what was called BDCs, backup domain controllers. And the, the PDC was writable and the BDCs were read-only. And then Microsoft, uh, when Windows 2000 came out, they made this announcement that all domain controllers are now writable. So it was a pretty big deal because it meant that you could sit down at any of your domain controllers and essentially it would replicate to the other domain controllers. Um, not too long after that, a few years down the road, Microsoft released the concept of what is called RODC. RODC is read-only domain controller. And the idea is that we can set up a domain controller that is not writable, that is only read-only. But the question is, why? That's probably what you're wondering. So I wanna, I wanna kinda explain that a little bit. So to, to help you understand that, I'm gonna pop open another drawing here and we're gonna take a look at some different locations. So for example, perhaps our main location might be in New York City. All right, New York City. Uh, and then maybe, maybe we've got, we'll just say New York. And maybe we've also got another location which we'll say is in, how about Texas? Maybe Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Okay, so Dallas. All right, and maybe we've also got a, another location over here in, let's make it uh, Birmingham, Alabama. I'm just gonna put Berm for Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, um, and maybe, you know, you've got some connections that connect these offices together, some, some wide area network connections that connect these offices together, and you've got domain controllers in each one of your locations. Uh, we'll say New York, we've got domain controller in New York, maybe a couple domain controllers in New York, all right, and maybe a couple domain controllers in Dallas, all right, so that'll represent those. Now, we're gonna say that Birmingham is a relatively new office and it's a very small office, okay? So whereas New York, maybe we've got like 500 employees, um, you know, we got different departments working there. Maybe in Dallas, we've got like, I don't know, we'll say 300 employees, okay? 
but in Birmingham, it's just a small, let's say like a sales office, okay? So this is really just a sales office where we have salespeople maybe that, that meet with um, different customers. And perhaps maybe there's only like, I don't know, we'll say 10 employees that work there. And there's not even a full-time IT uh, st uh, department or full-time IT staff that actually works in that Birmingham office. Okay, so this is where we get into why RODC might be beneficial, okay? First off, you have uh, IT people that work full-time in New York, IT people that work full-time in Dallas. There is somebody there monitoring domain controllers and managing everything in those uh, locations uh, for us at all times, okay? But when we get into our Birmingham office, it's just a small office. It might even be that it's, it's not well monitored. It's not, uh, you know, again, there's no IT people there monitoring anything. They're not managing everything and keeping everything safe. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more dangerous to, to put a full-blown domain controller in that Birmingham office. But here's the problem. Computers that are logging on in Birmingham, let's say that these, uh, this box here represents one of the client computers, that client computer, when he wants to authenticate with the domain controller, currently he's having to cross over to New York using the, the company's WAN connection or whatever in order to do that. And maybe users are complaining that it's slow. So we could, of course, put a full-blown domain controller and set it up over in the sales office in Birmingham. But at that point, um, you got to remember something. These domain controllers are all writable. If you make a change to one of them, it's going to replicate back and forth, right? Um, that means that if we were to put a domain controller, a full-blown domain controller in Birmingham, and something got corrupted because there's not IT staff there monitoring it and managing it all the time, that could replicate to New York, and next thing you know, it's in Dallas, it's replicated across the entire domain, and it could corrupt the entire domain. Okay, um, so a RODC would be a good fit for this style of uh, environment. So instead of putting a full-blown DC, we're going to put a RODC out there. So we're going to put a server. We're going to make it a RODC server. Okay, so it won't be a full-blown DC. RODCs are only read, they're read only. So that means that replication, when it occurs, it's going to occur this way. Okay, now the other thing that's great about RODC is that you can have it cache the passwords of the, the 10 employees that are in the office. It does not have to know everybody's password. So there's a security um, scenario there as well, if you think about it, to where um, I'm going to allow this ROD-C to cache the password of the 10 employees that work there, but, but no other passwords. So if somehow this ROD-C server got hacked, it's not going to know anybody's admin passwords or any of that. Okay. Um, now you can you can control that through using the the password objects uh, password caching feature that RODC has. So we get to control what RODC is going to know. And again, replication will ne never occur out here. It'll always have to occur incoming to RODC. So when things change, it's going to replicate to RODC. RODC does not ever get to replicate anything out. So again, if it gets corrupted or something like that, it's not going to do any damage. Okay, we get to control all of that. All right. Um, so ultimately, RODC can act as a, as a way of you, for you to set up a uh, domain controller that's read-only, not give anybody access to it. In fact, it doesn't even know, um, it doesn't know any admin credentials. So you may say, what happens if an admin visits the Birmingham office and tries to log on? Anybody that tries to log on, if RODC does not know their password, then RODC will do pass-through authentication. It means it'll send the authentication request up to New York, in this case, and New York will authenticate the user and pass it back. So if anybody tries to log on and it doesn't know their password, you, they can still get authenticated, it's just a little slower. Else, we could manually tell RODC uh, that we want it to cache a certain person's password. But ideally, you don't really want it caching like admin passwords and things like that. Because of the fact that this server is not thoroughly being monitored, uh, as much as the others because there's not an IT department or there's not IT staff working there, then ultimately what you're doing is you're, uh, you're making it where 
Um, it only knows about the 10 employees that work in the office. Okay, so guys, that is the idea of RODC. That is how RODC can benefit us. It's not used super duper often in the real world. There are certain circumstances where it can come in handy. But um, you can put DNS on that as well, by the way. So another thing that's handy is uh, you can have DNS set up on it and uh, your employees can query using DNS and all that right there with RODC as well. All right. But remember, RODC's read-only, and it's only going to be used in certain circumstances. Now, I'd like to show you a couple different ways that we could set up a RODC, all right, a read-only to make sure. The first method I'm going to show you is known as just pre-staging uh, a RODC server. Now, this is the way you would do things if you're, you have not set up a server yet that's going to be your RODC server, but you plan on setting up a server that's going to be your RODC server in the future, okay? So um, perhaps you are located in New York, but you've got a office in Birmingham, Alabama that's really small. It's only got 10 people, and you're going to be um, maybe sending a server down there or shipping a server down there, and you just want to be able to plug it in and have it and have somebody just step through configuring it real quick then um, you could do that. You wouldn't even have to be present when this, uh, this promotion occurs um, if you do what's called pre-staging. So let me show you how pre-staging works, all right? Here we are on NYC DC1. This is our domain controller. Um, and we're gonna open up Server Manager. Of course, you can click Start and go to Server Manager if you don't know how to get in there. Okay, from there, we're gonna go to the Tools menu and we're gonna go to Active Directory Users and Computers, okay? so. We're going to bring up Active Directory users and computers now, and um, from there, you'll notice you have the uh, OU, the organizational unit, which is a folder here that's going to contain domain controllers, and um, currently we only have one domain controller. So if we wanted to do what's called pre-staging a RODC, we can right-click that container, and you'll see an option that says pre-create a read-only domain controller. Now remember, you can't just right-click anything. It's got to be that container, domain controllers. Okay, so we're going to click to pre-create RODC account. Okay, we're going to click next on the welcome screen. It says, okay, are you which uh, privileges, which uh, credentials are you going to use to do this? So I'm going to use my administrator credentials in order to do this. All right, specify the account credentials to use in the installation. Okay, so that's going to be my admin credentials. You could specify some alternative credentials if you wanted to. All right, but we're going to use the ones that uh, we have signed in. All right, so we're gonna click next. It says, okay, what do you want the computer to name to me? Okay, I would just, I'll name it, um, I'm just gonna call it RODC uh, test. This is just a demo anyway. Okay, so RODC test. All right, I'm gonna click next. It's gonna verify there's not already a computer out there named RODC test. There cannot be a computer out there with this name right now. You have to Remember, this is you're pre-staging this, so you're setting this up before you even have a server configured yet. Okay, then it says, which site do you want to go with? I'm not explaining Active Directory sites right now, so we're just going to go with this default site. Okay, not explaining sites at the moment. Uh, this would be the location. Technically, I'll say that if you had a, a location in Birmingham, Alabama, you might have a, a Birmingham site. You would specify that, but I'm not going to explain that right now. I'm going to hit Next. Okay, it's going to check DNS information. All right, and essentially just verifying if there's a DNS name out there, if there's a certain IP address or something that goes with this, then at that point it will um, it will pop pop that up. Um, of course, you can also uh, speed this process up by disabling your network adapter card. It won't take as long, which um, sometimes I get annoyed by it taking so long. So if I wanna if I wanna cause this to get done quickly, what I'll do is I'll go right here to Ethernet, change adapter options, and I'll just disable the NIC real quick, and then re-enable it, and that will trigger it to finish a little quicker. As you can see, it didn't. it's done now. Sometimes it can take like five minutes for it to finish, and this way it just kind of gets it to skip searching DNS a whole lot. Okay, do you want to put DNS on the rod so you can? Do you want it to be a global catalog server? You can. Um, I'm not going to make it be a DNS, but I will allow it to be Global Catalog. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click Next. All right, it says, all right, so this is important right here. This is very important. This says, 
the user or group that you specify will be able to attach a server to the RodC account that you are creating now and complete the RodC installation. They will also have local administrative privileges. Okay, so imagine if, if I was, um, if, if somebody in Birmingham, Alabama, I'm in New York City, okay, we have Birmingham, Alabama, and we just have like 10 people that work in that office and they're all salespeople. So they're not like IT savvy people. However, I could specify one of their names. Let's say it's the sales manager, whoever that is, and I could give them admin privileges just locally on this server so they can help me configure this server once we uh, have the server uh, in, that, in, in that office. Because literally what I'm wanting to happen is I'm wanting somebody to basically just be able to plug the server in and um, they can, uh, they'll be able to install ADDS with these admin privileges and it's going to finish doing everything. They're not going to have to configure anything. Um, all they got to do is a couple of clicks and it's going to finish. So that's what this is going to do. This is going to give an account the authority to do that. All right. Now in my case, I'm just going to put myself in there. So I'm just going to choose myself. But in the real world, if you had somebody in that office you wanted to, to point to, you could. All right. At that point, I'm going to click Next, and we're going to click Next again, and we've officially created a little pre-staged RODC account. Okay, so at that point, um, you would be able to set up a server, and as long as you named it RODC test, RODC dash test, and you join the domain, that person in that office could could log in with their credentials, and they could finish the setup. All they got to do is a couple of clicks, and it's officially set up. This was, you know, in the earlier in the in the earlier two thousands, this was, you know, considered beneficial for, um, you know, to have this kind of connection set up. To be honest with you, almost nobody ever uses this anymore to set up a RODC. Uh, most everybody, if they're going to set up a RODC, they can do it remotely using remote desktop, or they would just install the RODC locally and they would just ship the server down to the office, um, and that would be an easy way to deal with it. Okay, um, now alternatively, something else I want to show you here, you'll notice the little black arrow is pointing down. That's just to indicate that currently the there has been no server that has occupied this yet. You'll notice it says unoccupied. So the server hasn't gotten control of it yet. But the other thing I want to show you, if we right click this object and we go to properties here, you're going to see the password replication policy. Okay, so this is where I can go and I can specify which accounts it's going to cache for, for password uh, authentication in that office. So currently, you're going to say it's going to deny all, everybody except one group. So if I had um, a salesperson, I could put that salesperson into this allowed RODC password group and that anybody that's in that group, it's going to synchronize their password unless they're an admin unless there's a deny, okay? So um, I don't have any additional users, but I'll show you, like I'll just create one real quick. We'll call this, uh, um, let's see, John Smith. Log on name is gonna be just John Smith. All right, let me put password in for the user, okay? And we won't make the user change password right now. And we're gonna put John Smith in that group. So if you'll notice, you have you have that group. Let's go right here to John Smith. We're gonna click member of. We're gonna do a quick search for the word password. Oops, actually, easiest thing to do. Let's just say find now. All right, and you'll see the allowed RodC password replication. So we're gonna double click on that, click OK. And he's now a member of that group. So John Smith, who maybe John Smith is, you know, he's he's in that office, um, the Birmingham office. All right. And he is maybe like a sales manager or something. So he's, you know, he's in that group. It's going to cache his credentials. So that is how you configure RODC so that it will cache somebody's credentials. Okay. So the other way that you could have done this is just to go straight over to the server. Okay, so I have NYC server one right now, and I could jump over to that server. Let's jump over, here we are, this is NYC server one. He is not a domain controller. Okay, I could go ahead and say manage 
add roles and features, next, 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 and we're going to install Active Directory just like we would a normal domain controller. Okay, so next, 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 and install. We'll give that a moment and um, let it install. Okay, once uh, ADDS is done installing, you can just uh, click OK to that. At that point, we're going to go up to this little uh, warning symbol. We're going to click Promote the Server to a Domain Controller. All right, and it's going to say Add a Domain Controller to an Existing Domain. RODC, of course, is going to be joined to an existing domain, so that is definitely going to be the uh, object or the option that we go with. All right, from there, we're going to go ahead and click Next. All right, now warning, if you get an error message, if, you, if you're doing this with me and you get an error message just trying this out, it usually means that your computer is no longer pointing to the domain controller for DNS. So what you need to do is you need to jump over to the domain controller, you need to go to command prompt, you need to do an IP config and find out what the address is of your domain controller, jump back over to the server, You'll go up here to uh, local, uh, local server. Okay, go back over here to your Ethernet assigned by DHCP. Just click on that. Go to the properties of your adapter and verify that you've got the correct address in right here. It's very important. If you don't, you're going to get an error. Okay, that's if you're doing this with me. Okay, so we're just gonna, we could have a DNS installed on this machine, we could global catalog, and this is where we can choose RODC right here. So at that point, we could choose RODC, directory services restore mode, uh, password, just like we've done before. We can click next. All right, we can specify, it says accounts that will be allowed to replicate. We can go ahead and specify the, the pa account passwords that are gonna be replicated and cached. We can specify those if we want. All right. Um, it says, okay, you want to replicate with any domain controller. That's fine. By the way, you can, if you have a backed up copy of Active Directory, you can do install from media to let you specify the backed up copy of Active Directory. That's a great way to save time if you're replicating a large, uh, you know, big database across a slow connection. If you had a copy of it, of Active Directory on, flat, on a flash drive, even if it's an out of date copy, it'll update once, uh, once it's done. So I'm going to go ahead and click next now. We can specify our database log location, and at that point, we're now officially ready to pull the trigger. It would do the prerequisite check, and we would click install. We've got ourselves a ROD. See, I'm not actually going to do that to this server because I have other usage for this, uh, other other usage for this server that I want to I want to use it for. But now you've seen exactly how you can set up a ROD C server. So our next lesson on PowerShell is what's known as PS remoting. All right. So um, the, the first thing to understand about PowerShell remoting is that there is a service that must be running in order for you to, to do PowerShell remoting, and that service is called WinRM, all right? So if we right-click our Start button here and we go to, um, we'll go to uh, Computer Management and we'll expand where it says Services and Services, click on that, scroll down, you have the Windows Remote Management Services you can see is running, okay? Of course, if we wanna do that in PowerShell, we'll just right-click the Start button, we'll go to Windows PowerShell Admin, and we're gonna type Get Service. <clears throat> From there, you can see that it is running, okay? Of course, you can also say Get Service, and then dash name, and then WinRM, and you can see just that specific service if you want. Now, um, the other thing to understand is that WinRM uses port uh, 5985 over HTTP connections, and there is a way you can set up a digital certificate and do encryption, and it'll use 5986, which is HTTPS for PowerShell, okay, which I'm not getting into right now, but you got to make sure that you don't, your firewall on your computers are not blocking that port. Uh, and you make sure that the WinRM is listening for connections. There's a there's a simple command you can run to make sure that uh, WinRM is running on a machine and that it's listening for connections. And that command is called WinRM Quick Config. If you type that, this needs to be uh, ran on the computer you're connecting into as opposed to connecting from. So I'm going to hit enter. You'll see that it's already running. Okay. 
Um, and then if I'm, I'm currently sitting at uh, NYC DC1, but if I wanted to do this on uh, NYC Server 1, I could do it on NYC uh, Server 1 as well, okay? Uh, and then so from there, uh, from there I could just right click Start, go to PowerShell Admin, and then just simply type uh, WinRM Quick Config. So WinRM Quick Config, and you can see that everything's running on that machine as well, okay? Uh, and just so you guys know, it, it is possible to uh, turn the WinRM service on on all the machines in your environment. You can do that through a group policy. I'm not going to get into how to do that right now, but if you're it interested in turning on WinRM for a, a lot of computers in your environment, you can. Keep in mind, too, that in order for a computer to be able to uh, connect into a WinRM service, um, authentication is going to be required. So there is going to be uh, authentication that's got to happen. All right. Okay, so uh, from there, we've got we've got WinRM running on both the machines, so we're good to go. Uh, here I am on NYC DC1, and I'm wanting to remote in and run a command. So let me show you very simply how I can remote in and uh, and see things that are running on another machine. So let's say I want to look at Git process. Now, if I just hit Enter right now, it's going to show Git processes just for my machine. But I'm going to hit space, I'm going to type dash computer name, and then I'm going to put in the name of that server, nyc-svr1. So I'm going to hit enter, and at that point I can see the services that are running on that machine. Okay, The, the processes, I'm sorry, the processes that are running on that machine. If I wanted to stop a process, I could. I can use the stop-process command. And I could stop a process. If you want to know how to do that, just go to look up the help article. It'll show you. But anyway, I can see the processes that are running on that machine. Uh, if I wanted to uh, view the services that are running on that machine, I could say git computer nyc svr1. It's going to show me the services that are running on that machine um, after it processes the command. The, the server doesn't have a lot of memory, so you might notice that it's a little bit sluggish and takes a little bit of time before you actually get a response. Okay, so there it is. All the services that are running on that machine. Now, something else you can do that's that's uh, that's really neat is um, you can type invoke-command computer uh, and we'll say NYC SVR1 and then we're going to do dash script block. And then we're going to do the little curly curly brace here. Um, now the little curly brace is going to be a command that you want to run. So this is another way we can run a command against that machine. If we had a script and we wanted to run against that machine, we could specify the, the, loc the name of the script and we could run the script. But So I could say uh, git dash event log dash log name we'll say is the security log dash newest five results I'm gonna do cur closing curly brace hit enter and there you go okay so invoke dash command uh, and then finally something else I can do I can type enter dash ps session dash computer name NYC SVR1 and I can connect directly into it kind of like you would with Telnet or SSH and I can run commands that way so for example I'm gonna type CD backslash DIR and I can see the folders listed on the C drive I'm just gonna say MKDIR uh, JC was here hit enter I just created a folder on the NYC server one so if I jump over now to that NYC Server 1. Let's look and see in File Explorer. Here we are in NYC Server 1, as you can see. If we look at the C drive, we should see that folder. And there it is. Okay, so it did work. Let's jump back over now. All right, if I want to exit out of that server, I can type exit, and I'm now out of that server. By the way, you can also run uh, commands against multiple servers at a time. Like I could say git dash service dash computer name, or actually let's do git dash process, it's a little quicker, computer name, and I'll say nyc dash dc1 comma nyc dash server1. It's going to run the command against both servers at the same time. Now, the downside of that is, is that by default, it's going to just wrap all the service, services up into 
one list and it's not going to separate those. I'm not going to be getting into how to do that, but it is possible to have a list separated by computer name. Okay, um, but ultimately, as you can see, uh, it does show the different services that are running between the machines. Okay, so very cool. There's there's a lot you can do with PowerShell. There, this this course is giving you a foundation and what you need to know in order to proceed and all that. But you can get into a lot of the advanced techniques, and there are PowerShell courses out there and all that that get a lot lot deeper. But this is just foundation. Okay, all right. So those are your main fundamentals for remoting into computers using PowerShell, and this is something that will help you with your server administration and, uh, and all of that. And I'm not getting into the, to the to remoting into cloud in this particular video, but um, you can obviously remote into the cloud as well and manage services through the cloud also. Now something else that uh, a lot of people don't realize about PowerShell is that it is its own scripting environment. It, it is its own programming environment. You can write programs, you can write scripting from within uh, PowerShell. And I want to show you some basic fundamentals with that as well to, to assist you in your server administration. So uh, first thing we're going to do, uh, we're just going to go straight into PowerShell. I'm just going to right click the start button here and I'm going to go to uh, Windows PowerShell Admin. And just to quickly show you, uh, you know, one of the common things that we do when we write scripts and in, in, uh, in most programming languages is we use variables. Variables are important. They are words that are associated with uh, an area of memory and allows us to call upon uh, that information at any time. Now, in PowerShell, we can type get dash variable, and we can see the variables that are in memory right now. Okay, so here are all the things that are in memory this very moment. Now I can also add something to a variable. I can say, let's do dollar sign number one equals five. So I'm gonna store the number five in a variable called number one. And to do that, we're just putting a dollar sign there. So there you go. So we're gonna say, uh, call upon that variable. Oops, we just type dollar sign number one, hit enter, there it is, the number five. Uh, we're gonna say dollar sign number two is 10. So now if we say get variable, we should see both of those uh, in memory right now. All right, so there they are, number one, number two. Okay, I can also use operators like uh, subtract, uh, addition, multiplication, division, all that. I can say uh, dollar sign number one uh, times dollar sign number two, and it's gonna multiply. I'll just at the up arrow, I'm gonna change that to subtract symbol. All right, so there's subtraction, we'll change it to addition, we'll change it to division. Okay, now, um, you can store words in there as well. I can say dollar sign name equals, we'll say uh, NYC server one. Okay, hit enter. Uh, oh, I forgot that term is uh, it's a it's a string. Whenever you do a string, you got to put a quotation mark there. So quotation mark, hit enter. It's now in memory. I could say dollar sign name, hit enter, and there it is. So watch this. I could say get um, process dash computer name dollar sign name hit enter, and it's going to um, it's going to display it. So it's going to use that variable. Now, ultimately, it's fine and dandy to try to run you know, commands and stuff and, and write coding and stuff within the, the PowerShell uh, environment itself, but PowerShell provides a scripting environment called the ISE, the Integrated Scripting Environment. You can get into that by just simply typing ISE. Hit Enter, and this is gonna make your life a whole lot easier if you're gonna write scripts from within PowerShell, okay? So I'll just maximize this. I'm going to drop down the little script area, and this is where you're going to write your script. Okay, so check this out. I could say get dash event log dash, and look at that. It actually shows me the parameters that are available. I can click on those if I want. Right, that's really cool. Uh, we'll say um, computer name, and then you know I could say NYC. SVR1, and then I'll say dash log name is the application log, and then I'll say dash newest is, we'll say 10. Hit play, and it's gonna play that. Now, let's add a little spice to this, all right? Let's make it a little bit more interesting. 
So I'm going to use a command. I'm going to declare a variable. I'm going to say dollar sign name equals uh, read dash host, and I'm going to say which computer would you like to connect to? So we're going to have it pose a question, and the answer to that question is going to get stored in that variable. We're going to do the same thing with um, with the log name. So we're going to say dollar sign log equals read host. Which log would you like to see? And then we're going to say dollar sign amount, and we're going to say read dash host. Which, or I say how many of the newest entries would you like to see? All right. So now we're just going to trade these. Uh, uh, parameter uh, values out for those variables. So we're going to change computer name to dollar sign name. We're going to change log name to dollar sign log. We're going to change newest to dollar sign amount. And there you go. We're going to hit play. And to look at the bottom of my screen, it says, which computer would you like to connect to? We'll say NYC SVR1. Which log would you like to see? Let's look at the security log, security. And then how many of the newest entries would you like to see? I'm going to say five. Hit enter, and there you go. All right. If I wanted it to format it as a, as a list instead of a table, I can put the pipe symbol right there, say format as a list. All right, we'll do it again. Hit play. Okay, which computer would you like to see? Let's do a NYC DC1 this time. Okay, uh, which log would you like to see? Let's do the system log this time. And then how many entries would you like to see? We'll say three, the newest three. And there they go. There is the newest three entries right there. Okay, I could also save this file, save as, and I could save this as a script. Okay, and I could I could run that script uh, anytime I want. Okay, all right. So again, this is pretty basic stuff, but I did want to just kind of introduce you to the ISE. It can make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, by the way, one other little thing: if you ever want to run just one line. Uh, of the script that you're typing, you can highlight it and then you can actually just hit play right here, run selection, and you can do that. All right. But hopefully that gives you a better understanding now of just what the ISE is and the fact that PowerShell is its own scripting language. Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course, and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure. If you'll check the description of this video, you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course. Now, in the full course, you're going to learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on, and I'm going to provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24-7. All you need is a web browser. So I hope you'll join me, and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the, uh, this channel to build and grow, and uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.